Yes, Ms. McMillan. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, Queensland is making positive and determined steps along the journey towards inclusion in education. Significant milestone for the state education system was the 2016 commissioning of the independent review into the education of students with disability in Queensland by the Deloitte Access Economics and has continued with the ongoing implementation of all 17 recommendations resulting from this review. And I think you've heard it referred to in short form as the Deloitte review. Um, for some of the witnesses you will hear today, um, their journey, as it might be called, has started a lot sooner than that. And for some of them, it's really been almost their entire career, but at least in a concentrated form for um, as long ago as seven years. And in fact, when Ms Triple uh, A spoke about some government funding having ceased, that was the government, federal government partnership that ceased about five years ago. So this was some of the impetus leading up to um, the Deloitte review, and Ms Dunstan will be able to speak to all of these matters um, in her evidence. So in responding to these recommendations, the department has developed a systematic and practical approach to improving outcomes for students with disability. This approach is outlined in the Every Student with Disability Succeeding Plan and involves setting expectations to ensure students are supported to achieve their full potential focusing on capability to ensure teachers are confident in their ability to support all students and partnering with parents so that parents and schools work together to help students succeed. Central to this work, as highlighted by the Commission on day one of the hearing, has been the 2018 release of the Department of Education's Inclusive Education Policy, which is largely informed by Article 24 of the UN Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disability and clearly in identifies what inclusive education is and what is not. Can I pause there to say that you will have read in Ms Dunstan's statement about the criteria of the earlier EAP and the broader ranging NCCD category, which is indeed a very broad definition and includes, for instance, autism uh, and other disabilities. And can I say there, we've heard a lot of evidence about, for instance, autism. And we want to emphasise that disability, of course, is much more than conditions such as autism. We've also heard about issues that's, such as wheelchair access. But we want to, um, and the witnesses today will speak of the very broad range of disabilities and the importance of putting the individual child at the centre of what needs to be done by each school um, in meeting their individual needs. We also want to point out that for a number of children, they have a constellation of disabilities, so that it is not that a child has only one particular disability. There may be a number of issues that need to be uh, at the forefront in meeting their needs individually. Moreover, this policy commits the department to ensuring children and young people from all social, cultural, community and family backgrounds and of all identities and abilities to attend their local school and be welcome. Access, participate and fully engage with the curriculum along their similarly aged peers, learn in a safe and supportive environment and achieve academically <coughs> and socially with reasonable adjustments tailored to meeting their learning needs and evidence suggests their pol this policy is already having an impact. I pause there to say, of course, it's limited at this stage given the recency of the policy. The Assistant Director General, State Skills Disability and Inclusion, Ms Dunstan, will share more information about this policy in her evidence. She will talk about how this policy has already begun to transform the way parents and students with disability experience education in the state school system. I pause there because you heard from Dr Bridle earlier this week um, and Ms Dunstan will be able to say that, for instance, as far as she understands, Queensland is the only state that funds our parent advocacy body 
um, and that was of course part of the Deloitte review. So that's obviously clearly a very important step. This policy is not just being viewed as a gl glossy document, but is actually being embedded in practice. And this is being reflected in school performance against four clear measures of success. This implementation is given the highest level of priority of oversight and governance. Ms Dunstan at paragraph 66 following expands upon this. These measures are improving the A to E performances for students with disability, increasing the proportion of students with disability receiving a Queensland Certificate of Education, decreasing the proportion of students with disability receiving a school disciplinary absence, and reducing the number of students with disability not attending a full school program. It is acknowledged that schools and teachers are at different stages of their inclusion journey. There could be no reasonable expectation that with a rollout across the state of a significant policy with curriculum requirements, attendance supports, professional development and follow-up, that there would be uniformity, certainly at this point in time. This goal is apparent from the early years of a child's development through Queensland's Early Childhood Development Program, which supports the transition of children with disability to school, and including more children with disability in kindergarten programs to ensure that expectations are in place from the outset and that students are supported with reasonable adjustments at every stage of their learning. You heard evidence from Mr Bates about this program yesterday, about the value of this program and Ms Dudston can speak to its effectiveness. For instance, in 2019, $63.6 million over the next four years has been committed to it. The importance of early engagement with children and families will no doubt become more apparent as the Commission continues its work. It is recognised that leadership is critical and supervision and support is provided to principals by regional directors with presentations, workshops, setting inclusions and better student outcomes for students as priorities. And again, Ms Dunstan speaks to this in her statement. Resources for teachers to support students with disabilities in the mainstream include the HOIS, H-O-I-S, another acronym, um, autism coaches, behaviour support teachers, inclusion coaches, professional development, to name a few. And can I pause there to say professional development, of course, includes much more than attendances at conferences and such like. Um, and are included again in the statements of the witnesses you will hear from. HOSES, another an acronym, are an integral part of the school team and you will shortly hear from three of them as they lead the cultural change within the schools that they work within. Um, Ms Dunstan, I want to turn to a number of matters that have um, fallen from the evidence this week. Ms Dunstan does address special schools, but given the further evidence this week, it is likely we will need to provide further material after this week. Um, and we note, for instance, importantly, the Commission has not heard from the independent school sector about this issue, um, so that um, whilst she will be able to give some evidence, it's likely we may need to give further evidence or notice about those issues. Issues such as restrictive practices, um, we respectfully submit are too complex for it to be dealt with on the run, so to speak, in relation to um, some evidence Dr Bridal gave, and it's submitted it warrants a full attention as a distinct topic. Um, Teachers' aides have been addressed in evidence. Um, and again, you will have seen from the statements a number of witnesses addressed this today, their roles, and Ms Dunstan can give her insights also um, as to their roles within schools. And I think, refreshingly, you will note from all of the statements <coughs> that all of them have individual perspectives about um, the education department's policies and the way in which it works within their schools, and they're all individualised. So it can be seen that they're all very much their own views of um, what they perceive within their own schools and roles. Um, Ms Dunstan will also speak of the importance of parent advocacy, and I've already touched upon that. In concluding, by ensuring that the policy of inclusion is embedded into practice, 
by supporting the capability and development of staff and by actively engaging with parents along the way, the department is focused on delivering, delivering a consistently high quality education standard for all students, including our most vulnerable. You will hear evidence from representatives from three schools who will paint the picture of what this looks like in practice. Thank you. Thank you, Ms McMillan. Yes, Dr Mellon. Thank you. The appearances are as per yesterday. May I thank my learned friend, Ms McMillan, um, sincerely for the forward copy of her opening this morning. It was a professional courtesy that we have appreciated very much. Actually, before you start, can I just um, ask Ms McMillan something? Yes, um, we don't have the benefit of the Commonwealth here. No. Um, we have heard, of course, that education is a state responsibility. Yes. Under the Constitution. Mm -hmm. That is true to a point. Yes. The Commonwealth has very extensive powers. Obviously, it has considerable responsibilities by way of funding. Yes. We are dealing with education and, in particular, the Convention. Mm -hmm. Article 24 of the Convention uh, obliges state parties, including Australia, uh, to uh, adopt uh, a right to inclusive education. Under the Constitution, the external affairs power, the Commonwealth can legislate, and indeed under the obligations by the Convention, is obliged to legislate, on one view, to implement a right to inclusive education. One of the things that, speaking for myself, I'd be interested in is what the position of the State of Queensland would be about the role of the Commonwealth in directly implementing such a right and how that would interact with the responsibilities of the State. I don't expect you to give a comprehensive answer immediately, but perhaps that's something you might like, like to uh, take on board at some stage to consider. I'll certainly be taking that uh, under consideration. That is certainly not something I would be giving an immediate answer to. I didn't, e I didn't expect that, but thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, Dr Malafont, I once again interrupt. <laughs> not at all. I can indicate that I'm instructed that the Commonwealth are um, monitoring proceedings remotely through an evidence hearing room portal. Yes. <laughs> um, I call Jewel Ann Kupila, Lauren Swancutt and Catherine Morris. Thank you very much for your attendance. Um, you are each, of course, can take the oath or affirmation as you wish. You could just follow the instructions of uh, the associate. Thank you. I solemnly and sincerely. I solemnly and sincerely. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give will be the truth will be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Please sit down. Thank you. I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm. I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Please sit down. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence that I shall give will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Please sit down and thank you again for your attendance. Dr. Melifont will now ask you uh, some uh, questions. If at any time you, anyone feels the need to have a break, please let us know and we'll do that. <clears throat> but our present intention is to continue to about 11.30 and then we'll have a break at that time. Thank you. Ms. Morris, I'll start with you. I'm going to do some introductory paragraphs for each of you and then we'll get into the substance of it. Can you state your full name, please? Catherine Morris. What's your current position? My current position is Acting Head of Inclusion for Regional, for this region. Okay. Um, what do you, how do you term this region? What, what's it called? Oh, it's called Queensland. North Queensland North region. North Queensland, okay. And your substantive position? My substantive position is Head of Special Education, Bond State High School. Okay. You have a Bachelor of Learning Management, the 2011, is that a yes? 
this. Okay, so with responses, we just need to speak so the transcription picks it up. Thank you. And where was that from? From Central Queensland University. And are you currently completing a graduate certificate of special education? I am. Okay. But that's actually, um, the university has stopped that, so I need to, I've done two units and then I need to continue that somewhere else. Oh, okay. <laughs> Do you know why it stopped? No. Okay. It's a shame. Mm. Okay. <laughs> you, you had enrolled a in a shame. course and then they stopped the course in the middle. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. I did recommend that I Sorry? apply to another university. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll make some inquiries. Um, all right. So you've had um, a lengthy history in teaching. I yes. have. Okay. Including teaching in, at Bowen State High School, Shivalam. Shivalam Primary School on Sunshine Coast. And Catherine High School, 1995 to 1998. In the Northern Territory. Yes. Did you start teaching at Bowen State High School in a special education program? Yes. And was that with a general allocation in history and geography in November 2011 until the second semester of 2013? Uh, I did geography, but I also was taught in the SEP classroom, special education classroom. OK. Now, your statement tells me that your allocation included acting as a Point two hoses. What does that mean? That means that a full allocation is is 20 hours or five days a week, and mine was point 0.2 of that, which was the equivalent of a day or four. I don't really know how to explain it. Yeah. Okay. So point 0.2 of a yeah. full time. Of a full, full time, time component. Um, so hoses is head of special education services, um, yes. and and that's terminology which is being phased out depending upon how people choose within a particular school to, to reframe that position, is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, so you got a substantive position in hoses, as a hoses in 2015? Yes. Is that so? Okay. And prior to your employment at Bowen, you led transition to work program for students with disabilities at Catherine High School in the Northern Territory. Yes. And you've also worked as an inclusion support assistant, assistant at that school. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Your work at Chevalum State Primary School includes supporting students with disabilities in mainstream? Yes. Okay. Uh, Ms. Corpilla, please state your full name, please. My name is Julianne Mary Melody Copula. I'm sorry, there you go. <laughs> sorry about the pronunciation, we've all got it wrong all week. What's your current position, please? I am currently the Head of Department Inclusive Practices at Ingham State High School. Okay. Do you hold a Bachelor of Education from Griffith University and a Diploma of Teaching in Primary and Special Schools? Yes. And approximately what years were they? Achieved. I um, commenced in 1985 and I finished my diploma in 87 and then in 1998 I did my Bachelor of Education. Okay, and so you've worked as a teacher in both mainstream and special education programs at various schools since that time? Yes. And you commenced at Ingham? on a part-time basis, January 27, 2007? Yes. Okay. And commenced working as the Acting Head of Special Education Services at Ingham in October 2014, appointed permanently in Term 3 of 2015? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Miss um, Swanka. Council often whisper to each other, so don't, don't worry. <laughs> okay, your full name, please. Lauren Marie Swancutt. Your current position. I'm currently seconded into a regional hoses inclusion role for the North Queensland region. Okay. Your substantive position prior to that? 
is as Head of Special Education Services at Tharangawa State High School. Okay. Do you hold a Bachelor of Education, Primary and Special Education from Charles Sturt University 2008? I do. And a Masters of Inclusive Education 2016 from that same university? Yes. Whilst you were completing your bachelor's degree, were you casually employed as a learning support teacher aide? That's correct. And that was at a local independent school? Correct. You did all your university practicums at mainstream schools? I did, yes. And that included a specific practicum involving co-teaching with another pre-service teacher. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, so in our um, degree at our university, um, it was a requirement uh, probably second or third year, I can't be certain on that given the time frame now, but um, that we did a co-teaching practicum with another student that was in our course. Um, so I actually returned to Tasmania, my home state, to do that with another student that was in the same degree as me. Okay. And so were the two of you pre-service teachers teaching we were both. classroom yep. together? Together, from the same year level in the same course. Yep. Okay. Um, you also had a six-week inclusive education internship in the final year of your degree. Can you tell me about that, please? Yes, so um, I made the decision to undertake a double major in my degree. So at the beginning of our third year bachelor, we had the opportunity to do a specialisation. Um, so some primary teachers choose to do music or HPE or a language. Um, in my instance, I chose to do special education, which resulted in us doing six um, master's level subjects as part of our undergraduate degree. Um, and one of the requirements of that was to complete um, an internship in relation to inclusive education. Can I ask you, those six master's level subjects, when you then go on to your master's of inclusive education, do they carry across as credit or yes, you start again? Yes, I was lucky. I was able to credit four of those. Okay. Did you commence your teaching career with a permanent appointment as a special ed teacher with the department in 2009? I did, yes. And did you teach within special education programs at Heatley Primary School and Kerwin State High School until 2012? Correct. Uh, and then you were appointed as acting head of special education services, is that correct? Uh, acting at Kerwin High, yes. Yes, okay. Then there was a uh, period of maternity leave. Yes. Um, and then back, and yes. then, then appointed as um, substantive hoses, which is now called head of inclusive schooling at Thurangawa. Um, post first round of maternity leave, I was appointed to Pimlico State Department. High School as teacher in charge, and I remained there until I won the substantive position at Thurangawa, yes. Okay. Now, uh, in addition to your... Um, your roles you've, you've mentioned, you've also worked as a regional autism, sorry, regional autism coach during 2018. Correct. So, can I just ask, were you doing that in addition to another substantive role at the same time, or you're acting no, in that position? No, so seconded into the role um, regionally, just like the one that we're currently in now. Okay, so tell me about that role, please. Um, so that role for me commenced um, in term two of 2018 until the end of, well, to the beginning of this year, actually, until I switched over to this current role. Um, so that was as a regional position to support schools to advance the inclusive education of students with autism. Okay. All right. So what does it look like on the ground? Sure. Um, so a principal would request um, support through their assistant regional director to the region. Um, and we'd have a conversation about um, what they wanted that support to look like and then I would go to the school and support the principal around the problem of practice that they were having in relation to a student or students with right. autism. And again, just trying to get to, to understand what it actually means in reality. So yeah. a principal tells you what they think they want something to look like. What, that, what might that be? I'm just trying to break through the language. Um, yeah, no, that's here. okay. I, I appreciate that. We probably speak in jargon. But, um, 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 so lots of the work, um, and certainly that there was. I was in a broad number of schools, so this is a broad sort of capture of what that work was about. Um, but supporting principals to understand the learning needs of students with autism um, and how to best cater for them at a whole school level, but also then working with um, at the classroom teacher level as well and coaching and skilling them about how to transform their pedagogy and their practice to ensure that that student with autism is successful in the day-to-day, -day, six hour delivery of curriculum. Okay. So it's about working out what kind of adjustments might be necessary. Absolutely, and problem solving 
those and, yeah. and helping the school yes get those adjustments in place and and working correct all right um, now before I move off um, your background you're also the um, national convener of the school inclusion network for educators which operates as a network of all means all the Australian Alliance for Inclusive Education, is that right? Correct. And that's in your private capacity? That's private, volunteer, yes. Okay. So, uh, and you're also a voluntary member on the steering committee for the Inclusive School Communities Project being facilitated by Purple Orange in South Australia? Correct. Okay, many people already know what that is, but if you could just briefly tell us what that is. Um, so Purple Orange have been commissioned uh, with some funding from the NDIA to advance um, some collaboration and support for schools in South Australia around inclusive education practice. Um, so to inform the delivery of that program and the use of those funds, um, they have created a steering committee which is, um, has a number of people from across a number of roles across Australia that help guide them um, in that work. Um, and I've also delivered some professional learning to those schools um, in relation to inclusive education and they've actually recently come to Townsville to visit our school and Bowen State High School as well uh, to see inclusive education practice on the ground in schools. Okay. All right. Now I'll start, um, I'll direct this question first to you, Ms. Swankart, and then I'll ask your input. Can, can you give me an indication of the breadth of type of disabilities that the school system encounters? Um, the school system encounters the full definition um, of disability as per the Disability Discrimination Act. Um, so people often default, I think, to thinking that it's just about the verified low incident categories of disability that we see in our system. but. Um, with the implementation of the nationally consistent collection of data, I think it started to broaden people's understanding of the scope of disability and that it also includes disability categories outside of those general six that we're more commonly familiar with. Okay. Ms Morris, do you have anything to add to that? No, that's, that is what it is. The common examples are much broader. They include dyslexia, they include mental health, they inc can include illnesses such as asthma, anything that may have a functional impact on that student's schooling. Okay. Do you have any res further comment with respect to that? Yes, um, we too have a variety. We have a diverse um, student group and their learning needs and we cater for their diverse needs. Thing, um, they don't operate in isolation, there's combinations of disabilities and we as a school are working and looking at a personalised plan in catering for their individual needs and support. So we are a school that is um, an hour and a half drive north of Townsville and we are catering for the individual needs and the diverse needs of this, the students at our school. All right. I'm going to go one by one and go through what's um, recent years and the development, so we'll get to that in a moment. But I want to ask each of you um, whether you have children in your schools, and I appreciate you now, two of you are now yeah. acting up from that position, so students in schools which are part of your domain, if I can call it that, that meet the eligibility requirements for special education schools but have chosen, and the parents have chosen, to stay within mainstream schools. Do you have children within that category? Absolutely. So just, just before yeah. you go on, could I ask you just to speak a little more slowly because we need to transcribe mm -hmm. and some of the language is quite yes. technical and therefore a little bit more difficult to transcribe than normal. So just if you don't mind, just a little bit more slowly. Sure. Thank you. Yes, so, absolutely. Ask, okay, <laughs> all right. Um, is that the position across the table? Yes. Sorry, could you repeat that question? Yes. So uh, what I want to ask you is if you have children in your schools or, or children under, in schools under your domain that would meet the eligibility requirements to get into a special ed school but are within the mainstream schools. Yes. Yes, we don't have a special school in our district and we have students who would meet the criteria for special schools within our <coughs> high school setting, yes. Okay. I'm interested to know then um, how 
the, the needs of such students are able to be met within the mainstream schooling system. Ms Swancott, would you like to start with that, please? Mm, sure. Um, there's no straightforward answer because we're talking about individual children that are obviously very dynamic um, as individuals, but ultimately it's about um, valuing their rights and understanding them as individual students and individual people um, and getting to know their functional impacts and their strengths, um, their motivations um, and their families um, and sort of being able to understand that holistic approach about them and then working as a team within our schools to address those things, utilising, you know, the broad, um, vast variety of experience and resources that we have in our schools to do that for any child, regardless of a child with disability. All right. So from your perspective, it can be done. Absolutely. I'm going to come back to you in a moment because I'd really like if you can think of a particular example or examples of children you're thinking about sure. and what, what you've done for them so we can actually get to an understanding of how this is working in practice, okay, Ms Morris? We have students in our school that do qualify or would qualify to go to a special school. They come to our school, they... Do you want me to talk about their needs? Yeah, yes, I do. I'm okay. trying to really get a vision of it Okay, if I can. so they have very complex needs. They have medical needs where they require such things as peg feeding, venting, catheterisation, toileting, they attend mainstream classrooms. Generally, if they have that level of complex need, they would have a teacher aide with them because the teacher aide will do the medical procedures in our school or in schools. They are working generally because of their lack of ability to communicate on highly individualised curriculum which means that's prior to prep or foundation. And that work is adjusted for them in a mainstream classroom. So they could be in a grade seven classroom, they could be in a grade nine classroom, and their curriculum is adjusted so that they are able to access the curriculum on the same basis as their peers. Okay. Ms. Copilla, did I get that right? Yes. Thank you. There is a process so I am having in my mind a Year 7 student coming to our, to our school and there is an enrolment process and prior we have experience days where we get to know the students and the families. Experience days or stays? Sorry. Days, days, sorry. Okay. Experience days. Okay. And this is from Year 6 coming into Year 7 and I meet with the um, primary partner schools prior to these days, we have in our district around eight or nine primary partnership schools that I work with getting ready to come to high school. So I work with the schools, but most importantly, I work with parents. So the parents, we have already the credibility. We have the trust of the parents. The parents work with, come and went to partnership and I say to them that you can bring an advocate. You can't need to just be coming by yourself. Bring your, bring an advocate, bring your family, bring whoever you feel comfortable coming and speaking to us. And they really say, look, we know, we're, we're fine. So we start this process of getting familiar for parents and the culture of our school to reassure their fears, getting ready to access a school where they can have wraparound support from all within our school. So we have the advocacy and it's about student centre. The student is the important person in this whole process. The student's voice doesn't have to be verbal, it can be electronic as well. It's really important in part. So this sets the whole platform in getting ready for inclusive practices and being valued member and feeling welcomed and support at Ingham State High School. So this starts, it could work transitions previously, beforehand, the child coming, meeting the classes and working. It's about the students' needs. Some students haven't been into regular mainstream classes. They may go to different parts of the school. So it's working around and looking at the support that we can provide that student and the family. 
and how they're going to get to school. All right. Any particular example that anybody can speak to about an ex of a student who would fit the criteria for a special education school? Ms. Sure. Honkart? Um, so I'm thinking of a particular student who um, had a verification of autism and intellectual disability and was also non-verbal. Um, he attended um, our school from when he was in year eight until when he graduated um, in year 12. He commenced um, that education in what was our pre-existing special education unit, um, but then transitioned um, in 2015 into our inclusive classrooms. So by that time he was in grade 10 and he was accessing curriculum at a foundation or prep level um, and teachers very much planned for him to be there from the beginning, that there was never any question that he would not be involved in the rigour of curriculum and the delivery of their lessons. So it ultimately started with the end goal in mind that that student would be a full participant in their classes. And so an example of that, um, Year 10 science, chemistry, school, uh, the students in Year 10 are learning to balance chemical equations and that sort of thing. Um, and he still was very much a participant in those lessons by utilising some visual checklists to go and collect the equipment for his group to conduct the experiment, um, to take photos of the experiment taking place and then sequencing those at the end to demonstrate his understanding of what had taken place using visuals to answer to yes and no questions of things that he would have observed during that chemical equation, supporting his peers to measure out the chemicals. Um, so it's just about um, understanding and acknowledging the scope and sequence of the curriculum and that we're just talking about the same content at different levels of complexity and that we can provide different access points for students to enter and participate in that same content together and that he still had a very valuable role amongst those Year 10 peers doing that higher order chemical equation balancing work that they do. What about the assessment process for students? How does that work in the case yeah, so, of a student of that time? Um, the same process, it's forefronted. So at our school, every unit of work for every subject for every year level um, is collaboratively unpacked as a team. So all of those Year 10 science teachers, for example, would have gotten together before the commencement of delivering that unit and they would have been able to go through the curriculum intent and clearly articulate what students need to know and be able to do to be successful in the assessment item for Year 10. And straight from there, they're able to utilise the scope and sequence of the Australian curriculum to backward map to the foundation level for this particular student and then be able to modify that know and do table to reflect that variance in complexity and have a clear understanding about what his know and do would be at the end of the unit and work to include that throughout all of that learning um, with you know, a modified assessment piece or a modified way of gathering the evidence of his learning at the end. <coughs> How does that work in terms of the school, <coughs> pardon me, reporting success rates, if that's the way sure. to describe so it? Sure. So in the state school system, we have what are called individual curriculum plans um, that are recorded on our school management system called One School. So for him, um, he would have had an individual curriculum plan recorded for science, indicating that he is accessing complexity at a foundation level. Um, and that automatically talks to reporting. So there would be a generated comment on his report card saying that he was taught in age-appropriate contexts, science, but his mark is reflective of the grading of the foundation level. Thank you. And that is right across all of our schools. That is the, how we assure that our students access curriculum on the same basis okay. as their peers, the same procedures. Thank you. So, uh, Ms. Morris and Ms. Capillo, I noticed you were nodding in response to Ms. Mm. Swancott's answers for the last two questions. So I take it you uh, agree with what's been said and yes. you've seen these things yourselves? Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you now, but I'll give you some further time to think about this in the morning tea break, and somebody will remind me to ask this again after morning tea. <laughs> um, can you think of any circumstance in which a child might not be able to be accommodated in mainstream? And I appreciate there's some criticism of the use of the term mainstream, but for the time being I'm going to use it. Is that something you'd like to think about over morning tea? Yeah. Do you, oh, do you want me? I'm, I could answer that yeah. now. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go. <laughs> Ms. Um, Morris. Do you want me to start? I'll start. OK. I... <laughs> I... Um, <laughs> We have a range of students 
with very complex needs at our school that we cater for. So I can't say that any of those students are not able to achieve their education in our school. Okay. So every one of those students attends mainstream classrooms, every one of those students accesses curriculum at their level, every one of those students receives the support they require for their complex needs, they attend all and participate in all school events, and they are def definitely valued members of our school community. There is no different. There are no separate places for them to go. They attend school and the same participation as all students. Thank you, Ms. Morris. Uh, oh, Ms. Capilla. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. That's three. It must be confusing for you. I um, would like. Could you just rephrase that? Can you just say the question again, so I've got it clearly in my yeah. mind? Yeah. What I'm asking is, can you think of any circumstance or an example of where a student's not able to be accommodated in mainstream, that is, where a student would have to go to a, a segregated special education facility? Okay. As I said earlier, we don't have any special schools in our district, so all of our children attend their local school. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, I have a visual of a young lady who attended our school last year and who's currently still in our school. So I contacted the Inclusion HOD for Autism, Inclusion Coach, because of the, the problems that we were encountering at school. And we worked with a large team in complex case management and the parents and the paediatricians and we worked together with this young person. This young person's life last year was one where she, at home and at school, we were, they, we were having the same story. This young person was, for reasons, working in a very isolated self at home and at school she had withdrawn from participating in school events and at home. This young lady this year, working with her parents and working with her, and we have taken her on school camp we are attending her classes, exactly as Lauren said what we're doing. She is part of the whole school. The students are mentioning how wonderful it is to have her in class with them. Her parents, her grandparents, and her siblings are so excited to see her. And we know that we still have a journey to go, but it's so exciting. And I'm really proud, and so are her parents, that we're accommodating for her needs at our school with wraparound support and then she is welcomed, she is safe and she belongs to our local school. Thank you. Ms Wonka? No, we're the same mirroring um, the other two schools. Um, we're certainly welcoming of every child and it's certainly within our capacity to provide for every child. Um, and we welcome that challenge and that it extends our professional capability. Um, and we certainly learn as much from them as as much as what we give those individuals. Okay. In one of the responses, there was a mention of family engagement and, and in some of your statements you speak about this. Um, how important is family engagement to the success of the student and of the school? Um, Ms Morris, do you want to start? Uh, Ms Capiella, do you want to start? I'm going to have to give you, get your tag. <laughs> <laughs> I value parent, family engagement, carers, we have out of home care um, students, we value and it's a partnership. So we listen, we provide access for them to meet, we make sure that you know in advance that we can meet, we let them know so when we had this complex case management, these are the questions that we're going to ask. As a family you might like to consider this so the questions are given beforehand. There is no preconceived idea what the parents are going to say. So the parents are valued and we're listening to what they're saying. We're actively listening and they see it as a partnership. They, we have protocols. We have protocols of, of when to meet, how to meet, and communication. And I'd like to just quickly mention communication. Mm -hmm. We ask the parents, how is the best way to communicate with you? Some may want an email. Some may want a phone call. Some may say, look, 
please don't let us know until something happens or let's work together in certain ways. So it's an individual family basis of how we communicate and we're proactive. We're active, we're proactive communicating with parents. Okay. Ms. Morris. We consult with parents at every stage of the child's education from before they come to our school we meet. Mm. We meet with them regularly as case managers. Any decision that's made in regards to their education is discussed with the parent. They come in, will come into a meeting. They'll meet with all of their teachers on a regular basis. If ever there's an issue, all teachers will come and speak to the parents. So they're very involved in every step of the education that they're, they're consulting with them and them agreeing with the child's plan is imperative. Ms. Von Klott? Yes, student and parent voice is very much at the centre of the work that we do as well. Um, we're probably slightly a little bit different in terms of our demographic that we sometimes have the challenge of engaging our parents. Um, our demographic is one which has been disengaged for education for quite some time for some children, um, but it's certainly not without trying on our behalf and without wanting and at every opportunity that we can, um, we are seeking that parent voice and that parent input. Okay. Now the next question should not be taken in any sense to be critical of families or carers because there can be all number of reasons as to why family or carers aren't engaging or aren't able to engage with the school. So, but what I do want to understand is um, what are the challenges for the schools when you're not getting parent engagement? Um, I think the challenge is not having, you know, that full understanding of the whole child. I mean, we're obviously not in their home lives and in their home circumstances and those situations give so much to that child and are so much about that child. So, and it leaves us in a position where sometimes we have to make assumptions, which is certainly not what we want to have to do. Um, so it is, it is difficult and it's certainly a very important piece that we would like to have and would like to be able to champion and have involved um, with our students, but it's not always the case. And, but for us then the default is the child themselves. They're obviously there with us um, in our schools. Um, and we empower them as much as possible to provide that voice um, through, you know, one-page profiles about their strengths, their interests, what adjustments they think they need and they would like. Um, and we work very hard to make sure that that voice is heard and communicated across all of their teachers. All right. So nods from Ms Morris and Ms Capella. Okay. Can I want to go through now? Um, the journeys of your schools. Now, you've set them out in some significant details in the statements. We don't have time to go through all of that today. But can I give you um, the paragraph numbers from your statements so you know where I'll be taking you to, please? Ms. Copilla will be uh, 5 to 21, Ms. Swancutt's 8 to 27, Ms. 5 to 21, Ms. Swancutt 8 to 27, and Ms. Morris from seven onwards, I haven't in the last number. <laughs> seven <Okay>. onwards. <laughs> <laughs> All right. To infinity. All right. Treat it like an exam. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Ms Morris, can I start with you? Okay. So this is your work at Bowen. And just recapping, you, you commenced the role of hoses in 2014. Now, Bowen does not have a segregated SCP unit, special, special education program unit? No. Okay. Just so we're still getting familiar with all the, tech, uh, the terminology, so in brief terms, what's an SCP? A special education program. And what does it mean? It means that a place or a classroom, we use it in the sense of a classroom where uh, students with disabilities went away from, separate from the main school classrooms. Okay. Now, um, now all students learn, all students learn in mainstream classrooms at Bowen? All students. And in terms of um, implementing inclusion in your role, there's been a prioritisation of co-teaching. 
It's been a prioritisa priority, yes. co-teaching in, in the method of being able to ensure that all students can be taught in, co in mainstream classes with their peers. All right, can you tell me how that works? So that works by, with two teachers in a classroom. But pro let's talk about prior to that, yes. when we decide or on the class makeup, on who goes into the classroom. So that that will be decided the year before. So this year we will look at our students, a diverse range of students, including the broader range of disability and all the diverse learners in our school. And we will begin to populate our classrooms. Then we will decide which classrooms will be co-teaching classrooms and that will depend on the diversity of the students in the room and which other students that may need support would be a teacher aide. So if you had, for example, because we have limited sources, uh, resources, if we had a child with a very complex medical needs that would need to go to, that would be in a classroom, they would probably well, would have a teacher aid because they have the experience to do those medical procedures. And then, so they wouldn't have a co-teaching classroom, but students that required academic support will more than likely be in a co-teaching classroom. Oh. So they are the, t the students that will be working at different levels of curriculum, at different year levels, and two teachers are able to support that through co-planning, co-teaching. So I do want to go back to that earlier step, which is the, the choice of class allocation, not classroom allocation, yes. but students allocated yes. into a class. What are you trying to do there? What we're trying to do there is ensure that students that need the support of two teachers, that, that need the adjustments, are able to be in a class with two teachers so that they have the ability to be able to do that as a team. And it's also about building the capability of the teachers yeah. to be able to do those adjustments okay. to curriculum. So you're not just talking about students with verified disabilities? No, we're talking about a broader range. Mm. There could be uh, students um, who, EALD, who are Indigenous students who speak, don't speak standard Australian English. It could be out of home care students. It could be that diverse range of students that are on the inclusion and diversity policy. Okay. And so the aim is to provide co-teaching classes. Well, would you like to have co-teaching all the time? Yeah. Okay. Right across the board. <laughs> yeah. really uh, great. But at the moment, there's not the resources for co-teaching all the time for all the classes. I take it. Am I right? Sorry, could you... I repeat? take it that at the time, there's not the resources for co-teaching all of the time in all of the classes? No. Okay. So I'm correct about that. Mm. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So you make a selection, therefore, about um, which cl which classes will be co-taught. The selection is really about is def absolutely definitely about providing the adjustments, the reasonable adjustments that students require. Okay. What I want to take you to is paragraph 13, and you're going to help unpack some of this language for me, please. So you've spoken about collaboration and co-teaching being signature practices across Bowen State High mm -hmm. School, and then you said this. This practice supports the guidelines of the P12 curriculum assessment reporting framework, including the whole school approach to differentiated teaching and learning individual curriculum plan policy and the student wellbeing framework, all of which have their own acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's start with the first one because I'm drowning in acronyms. P12 curriculum assessment reporting framework, what's that? That is a policy that we follow in regards to curriculum assessment report and reporting and there are guidelines that we follow and are to do with those for all students. Okay. What is the ICP, that is the whole school approach to differentiated teaching and learning, individual curriculum plan policy? What's the that? whole school approach to differentiated teaching and learning is another policy and guideline 
to differentiated teaching. So these are all internal documents? Yes, these yes. are all underpinned underneath the P-12 curriculum assessment and reporting framework. Okay. And the student wellbeing framework? The student wellbeing framework is once again another policy that underpins the P-12 CAF. Um, but local or local policy? Or? No, these yes. are all uh, Queensland state policy. Thank you. Now, you speak in paragraph 14 about leading the cultural change of inclusion by, by a number of things. I won't go through all of them, but can I ask you, in respect of D, which is facilitating the professional development of the co-teaching training manual, what does that mean you're doing? Well, within the co-teaching training manual is professional development that's required to be a co-teacher. Yes. And I facilitate that professional development. Does that mean you deliver lectures, I deliver, reading? I deliver the workshops, the readings, the training, the, the um, instructional coaching, the disability standards for education, that all, that, all the modules within that manual I facilitate. Okay, so that falls to the hoses or whatever terminology this particular school is using to... This is a local, this is a Bowen yes. State High School training manual that yeah. we designed. That, yeah, that's what yeah. I'm asking. Okay, so um, what educational learnings were you, were you given in order to be able to facilitate the imparting of that information and, and training? Okay, so I attended Quality Schools Inclusive Leaders uh, a, an initiative of more support for students with disabilities. Okay, so that's QSIL, QSIL. To, to developing the manual. Yes. And within that, I developed my skills in all the manual, all the modules in the training manual. Okay. Now, I think each of the statements refer to QSIL and the more support um, module. But in terms of QSIL, and the training you get under that, what are we talking? Are we talking a week's course? Are we talking online? What is it? What was it? <laughs> so it was an initiative to, uh, for more supports for students with disabilities to develop a program and develop professional development uh, for leadership teams to yeah. understand and the knowledge and understandings behind inclusive practices. Yeah, okay, but what was it? It went for two or three days I yeah, oh, sorry, from memory. The time. Yes. Okay. So the principal um, took along their chosen members of their school leadership team to the delivery of that professional learning. Okay, now since the 2018 policy has been in place, um, what training, if any, have you received in respect of your role as a HOSE, or Head of Department Inclusive Services, to impart? Locally. Okay, so. If, if any. <laughs> How does anybody to answer? So, what I'm trying to get from the panel yes, at the moment okay. is I want to understand now. So, for the people who are at that head of department level, mm -hmm. which used to be called the hoses, mm -hmm. what training are they getting in order to be able to impart the knowledge and learnings around inclusion to the people within their school community? So, Ms. Swancott, can you tell me about that? Um, Specifically, I think in our region, it's the delivery of um, some inclusive education forums that the inclusion coach um, has been leading. And then with our appointment um, to the regional roles, and when I was also the regional autism coach, I supported the creation and the delivery of those. Um, we also, I lead um, the delivery of an inclusive education cafe that happens three times a term here in Townsville and I prepare the resources for other people like Catherine to deliver those in other areas of our region and I also travel to other regions to deliver it as well, which is a bit more of um, a, ca a casual gathering of professional learning for teachers to come along, sorry I've just realised I'm talking really fast, um, and pose problems um, of practice or challenges of practice um, that they voice themselves and that then we address through some professional learning for them and opportunities to network, coach and overcome sort of those issues. Okay. So, I'll, we'll come back to it in a second. Um, please remind me to do so. 
the inclusive the inclusion inclusion cafe. Inclusive education cafe. Thank yeah. you. So that's um, something you created and developed. Yes, that's okay. correct. The inclusive education forums is something that comes from higher up the hierarchy. The regional inclusion coach commenced those, correct. Okay. How often are they held? Um, quite frequently, um, at least once a term, um, okay. to ensure that we're able to cover the range of principals and leadership teams across our region. So um, they go on the road as well out to the other parts of our region, but also here in Townsville, of course. Okay. So who gets to go? Um, the regional inclusion coach is the main person, but then we also go in supporting roles to help her deliver that content as well. Okay, so I'm trying to get the two pieces of the puzzle. So it's the regional inclus inclusive coach says mm -hmm. people who are in your acting positions. Yeah, in other yeah. regional roles, I'm delivering this. Can you come and support some delivery of that? And it's just about scheduling and, you know, people's calendars and things. Okay, so that's one piece of the jigsaw puzzle, but who from the school gets to go? Oh, anyone that the principal mm. would like to send along, ultimately. It gets sent out um, as an expression of interest to all principals to send any number of staff that they would like to attend. Okay, and how long does it go for? A day. Okay. Um, Ms Morris, you were going to say something? I was going to say that in our roles as hoses of inclusion, we present those forums with the inclusion coach. To the staff? To the staff that come from across the region. All right, have you been to an inclusive education forum? Yes, I've been to one, I've presented at one, and we present them now with the inclusion coach. Okay. Ms Coppella. Thank you. Um, I'd like to first say that to, I've attended two state conferences. Okay. And they have been um, two, three days off the top of my head, and the inclusion policy is coming out, the Deloitte was mentioned there, and so the starting of the reform. From there, it's now taken to a regional basis where we have the inclusion pod and the inclusion coach, and we attend a day with the principal and with other staff members who wish to attend, and we will have information given to us there. We then go back to our schools, and in our school we have professional learning communities, and we have time where I then deliver, and we've been given vignettes, we've been given um, resources uh, about what's happening with inclusive practices and moving forward. So we d deliver those there. I am do my own professional learning. I'm involved in global book studies on professional learning I, in inclusive practices. I follow Twitter, uh, Twitter, which I then send out professionally. And we as a school do our own book studies and developing our own professional learning. Okay. Can, may I interrupt with a Yes, question? of course. Um, so one of my experiences in my professional past is that the people who volunteer to come aren't always all the people you need to have the impact on. Um, and you said that the principals choose or people volunteer. How do you reach the people who might be um, slightly less enthusiastic about mm -hmm. inclusion yeah. than uh, than obviously you are. Yep. So that's if always, I can put it in a nice way. Yeah, that's mm. always the challenge, and um, often to those events, you're certainly right. They're, they're the people that are already in roles like ourselves um, that often come along, um, or special education teachers. I guess that's why we also uh, developed the Inclusive Education Cafe. So it's an after-school event that requires no commitment on behalf of anybody. You can come if you want to come, and you don't have to if you don't want to. Um, and we host that um, at a variety of schools in our region too. Um, so often the school that we're hosting it at for that day, people will will come in that wouldn't normally come along um, to those things. And because it's more of a casual and relaxed um, atmosphere and it's professional le learning born directly out of their own direct questioning, we're certainly seeing um, a lot more commitment and uptake of people that don't generally come along to the other more formal learnings that we offer. Um, this semester, we've also developed a suite um, 
of web conferences that we deliver um, over, over the internet um, that people, again, don't have to even acknowledge that they're listening to or watching. Um, and so we certainly know that people are tuning in to those as well. So um, we're always you know, creatively thinking of ways that we can reach um, a broader range of staff in our department. I think we Commissioner have Mason has a question Sorry. that she would like to ask. Um, I was just interested in the comment about uh, there are parents in a demographic that struggle yes. to engage uh, with the school and therefore it has a flow and effect to the engagement with their child. Yeah. I'm particularly interested in First Nation parents. Yeah. Um, is there, a, uh, is there an, an avenue, uh, a gathering conference, which brings together parents, uh, schools, but also leaders from that First Nations service sector to talk specifically about disabled First Nations children and issues around disengagement and around the fear of engaging, particularly around diagnosed disability, but also potentially undiagnosed disability. Yes, I uh, raised that as a point um, in my statement as well, around the acknowledgement um, of, of culture and how disability um, is thought about in different cultures in our school, certainly um, is something that we're very aware of in the demographic of our school. Um, we're very lucky at our school that um, we have the engagement of Clontarf and STARS, two federally um, funded programs um, that are placed in schools to support the engagement of young Indigenous men and young Indigenous girls. Um, and they certainly work in um, strong collaboration with us teaching staff in relation to engaging families. Uh, we also have community education counsellors um, and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander teacher aides and support personnel in our school um, as well and we are very much in collaboration with those and um, are very respectful um, of how we interact with our families from different cultures, absolutely. Um, if I could just oh, sorry, clarify... Sorry, I think, I think just was, sorry, you, you oh, wanted sorry. to say something? I'm sorry. I wanted to add, in our, in our case at Ingham State High School too, that we have um, the CEC in operation as well, but we have the wraparound support and we're running the ARTI program and we're part of the ARTI program and that's looking at and assisting students coming to school and working with parents through the ARTI program as well. And Sorry, what was the name of the program? Artie, as in Arthur Beetson. It's former oh. Origin <laughs> Greats, so it's called the Artie program. It's spelled A-R-T-I-E. Okay. Um, yes, so we're working and then through negotiation, because some people don't have phones or credit or, or a vehicle, we go and with our CEC and go and do home visits, which is negotiated, wherever that would be. You know, it may not be at the home, it might be in other arranged areas as well. Sorry. And with co-teaching and even the definition of the inclusive school, you're meaning the full diversity yes. where uh, I just wanted to clarify that. Yes. And then I had a second question about parents um, that, and you may be going to come to this and if you are, I won't, but in That's the fine, transition from um, a special, you know, sort of unit into an inclusive school, um, parental expectations, you know, has anyone had experience um, of really bringing parents with you on the journey where they may have been quite fearful yes. and understandably, you know, really worried about it and resistant to yes. it? Yes. Yes. Right. Uh, who'd like to start, Ms Morris? Yes. When we first were doing our action plan and, and speaking, and making moves towards all students being in mainstream classrooms. We met with parents before, at the end of that, of, at the end of 2013, when we were going to go into a fully inclusive model in 2014. They were very concerned, some parents, some of their, their children had never been, had always been in a unit. And they were scared, really, of them being in a mainstream setting scared of perhaps being bullied and not being able to cope. So we had to meet regularly with them and reassure them that we would be able to give the same support, the same social 
an emotional support that we would if they were in a unit, which we did. And over time, that be they became a lot more comfortable and data and experience showed that their children were very successful and their social emotional well-being was healthy and well. And we don't have that, that concern anymore from any parents. We did have a student that came from a special school to our school and her parents were very concerned to begin with, her family. But over time, once again, they became very comfortable and pleased beyond, really, at her success in a mainstream school. She, she moved from being a not very confident student to an extremely confident uh, young lady who was a very successful member of our school. I've had the same experiences where I've had students come from special schools to our school and parents feeling fear and the conversation just recently is that she would like to say that we all need to be covered in gold and that she's holding us in the high esteem, this parent who is a care of out-of-home care. Her young person attends school with his peers, he goes to school camp, he goes to the school social, he's out with all his mates and his communication and his body language and his growth is just amazing and when he walks down the street because we're a little town, everybody says his name and says hello. And she doesn't know who these people are, but she knows that they must go to Ingham State High School because they stop and say hello to him. We heard yesterday from Dr Mann, who conducted a study, uh, I don't know whether you followed that evidence, uh, as to why uh, parents might uh, withdraw children from mainstream schools and send them to special schools. Um, have, any, have you had any experience of parents withdrawing children from the mainstream schools with which you are associated? No. 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 We don't have a special school where we live in, in Bowen, but I've never experienced that. No, and I don't have a special school. In my school. entire career. No. We do, but no, we haven't. <laughs> Uh, Ms Swankart, did you um, want to add anything to the response to Commissioner Galbali's question? Um, no, just mirroring the same sort of thing. Yes, we had parents um, of students who were in our previous special education unit who had engaged in their entire schooling in a special education unit, so you can obviously understand that they're, that they're quite nervous um, about proposed changes. But for us, it was just about um, being able to provide information to them about what it would actually look like. Their angst was more about not understanding what inclusive education actually meant um, and what the support would look like for their child. So we spent you know, a course of six months very thoroughly and systematically planning for the change in what we did and we uh, ensured that we engaged with parents throughout that entire process, as we did with our staff. Um, and we're willing to sit in that space to ensure that people were confident um, with the decisions being made and that they did understand what we were talking about. Um, we did have some parents who, um, you know, really needed the opportunity to sort of see it, to fully understand it, and were still quite um, anxious into the beginning of 2015 when we first um, launched into inclusive classrooms. Um, but again, very quickly, within, you know, a week or two, once they saw the success and the happiness of their child and had their own child's voice about never wanting to return to what was before, and those children going on to be incredibly successful in our school, um, has now allowed those parents who openly see us out in the community to say that they are our biggest advocates and that they thank us very much for the work that um, ended up occurring at our school. Thank you. I want to come back to the topic of um, departmentally imposed, I don't mean that in a bad sense, um, requirements for training of heads of department. Um, and acknowledging, as Macmillan um, acknowledged for the state, that we are in its infancy in terms of inclusive policy. I just want to get, us, I just want to get the meets and bounds of what it is that the department says you have to do by way of training um, as a head of department. 
Um, to my knowledge, there is no mandated training. I believe that um, the proficiency of teaching staff and heads of department and their professional learning is the responsibility of the school and the principal to ensure um, that staff have the capability to fulfil the roles that they are appointed to. Okay. Um, Ms Morris, do you have any different no. answer to that? Um, and that was really directed to your role as, um, your current role as acting mm. regional. Uh, did you have any observations at your level in respect of any other mandate? No. No. Um, no. Okay. So, um, am I correct in understanding, and I take this from the position descriptions to each of the heads of um, special education services, that the only mandatory requirement for that position is um, current full registration or current provisional registration with eligibility for full registration as a teacher? In Correct. Queensland. I believe that to be so, yes. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask the question Commissioner Atkinson asked, but I'm not going to ask it as nicely. Um, oh, <laughs> um, in your, and this is directed in your current roles as acting. Are there teachers who, are, who may be pushing back against the no notion of inclusion who are able to slip through the gaps? Yes, there would be, yes. <coughs> well, they don't speak to me about that, mm. but... <laughs> uh, observed practice would suggest that, yes, there are, there are teachers that are resisting... But what's that mean? ...diversity in their classrooms. OK, what's an observed practice which would indicate that? Um, I spoke before about forward planning um, to ensure that every child is included. Um, so I've perhaps seen lessons where, um, you know, that they're taught to the middle of the class, for example, and that individualised adjustments aren't necessarily forefronted and planned for, and therefore the child cannot successfully engage in lessons, mm -hmm. um, and that they defer, I suppose, that responsibility to other adults who may be in the classroom or who may be in the school uh, to come and sit with or deliver learning to children. Okay. Can I uh, put the question perhaps in a slightly different way? You are each obviously very dedicated and very successful in what you've been doing. Across the board, how successful, in your judgment, has the policy of inclusive education been in the areas with which you're familiar, or indeed in Queensland in general? Can I answer that? Of course. So within my school, we have, um, we decided to review our inclusive practices and we requested an outside person to come and review our practices and we used a, an auditing tool called signposts for inclusion and the person here on my left is the person who came <laughs> to our school and then we as a how, how did you do sorry how did you do i'm going to tell you oh, thank you for asking <laughs> so then we broke into small groups and we did it across the school and there's school a b and c and there are nine domains we at Egan state high school recognize that it's a journey and we are in domains of school b and school c so that is across the whole school and we looked at it wasn't just from a leadership, it was across with the teachers and where they were feeling. I'd also like to say that in our recent school opinion survey, that this year in our staff, they recognise that 100% referred to that we are an inclusive state school, that we are at Ingham High School inclusive practices, and we got 100% in our survey of our staff. That figure correlates neatly with some, the number of students who graduated Oh, yes. Yes. As it happens from your school in that year. Um, Ms Morris, did you want an opportunity to, to answer this I wanted this to question? speak. I did want to speak about when you said did, were all the teachers basically on board with inclusive education. I would like to say that at Bowen State High School, I believe majority are. Um, I believe that because well, through conversation and through when they come to see and, and talk about the capability building and, and professional development that they feel that they need. And that's always directed it towards the adjustments that the students need in their classroom. And when our, our school was reviewed this year, a four yearly review, 
the reviewer spoke to us as a leadership team and said how commented on the inclusive our inclusive school and said that every teacher that they interviewed not one said that they didn't believe that all students should be taught together in the same classroom I should clarify that my answer was in response to my broader regional role and not my direct experience yes. at Tharangawa. It would yes. mirror the same because of the I, culture I, I, in our I, I was really asking in part yeah. about the broader experience. Yes. Good, yeah. Yeah. I understand the position in the school yeah. you're each yes. associated with. Are you able to say what the position is more broadly within Queensland? Um, I can say that every school that I see in this position that I'm in now and visit in this position, are engaged in, com in the conversation and are engaged in the signpost document and are reflecting on where they are as inclusive schools and having conversations in where they would like to be and what their next steps are and how they're going to go about that. I can only talk from my yeah, own personal yeah. preference and scope, so I can't add to that. Mm -hmm. You've each been told previously that um, I'm going to give you an opportunity a little bit later to tell me what your wish list might be. <laughs> um, and you're in a good position, obviously, to speak to that given your experience about how things are going and, and how you think, mm. think things might be able to be improved. And, and so if you have um, any thoughts that you wish to share after, at that point in time about how we might be able to bring those along yeah. <laughs> the journey, I'd be, be glad to hear of it. Now, we're almost at morning tea, and I, I have promised that each of you will have an opportunity to tell the Commissioner about your journeys, but can I, can I before morning tea, can I ask Ms Swancott this? Um, and I'm not going to identify the particular schools that I'm asking about, no. um, but as a general proposition, there is um, local autonomy in terms of how a school implements inclusion within their school, yes? Correct. Okay. Now, Currently in your role, you're involved in supporting two schools which are not as progressed, shall we say, as Thurangawa or Bowen or Ingham in the inclusiveness process. Is that yes. fair? Yes. Good. Okay. How far are they? How far are they through compared to, say, Thurangawa? Uh, they are still currently um, offering segregated classes for students with disability. Okay. So, in comparison, we don't offer that at all. So. Right. So, your statement talks about those schools being in the phase of analysing data, considering human resourcing implications, identifying school systems and processes that can be impacted first to support implementation. And so, implementation has not yet commenced. I just want to understand that language. What does that mean, the phase of analysing data, considering human resourcing implications, identifying school systems and processes that can be impacted first to support implementation? Um, so genuine inclusive education isn't achieved overnight by closing a segregated class and having those students turn up into a regular class the next day. It's actually far more involved um, than that in terms of it being successful and in terms of those students not actually receiving micro-segregation within a regular classroom, which can still very easily occur when children are seated separately with a teacher aide within a room and taught separate curriculum. That's not what we're aiming for. So we have to appreciate that this isn't overnight work. Mm. Um, and in my leadership of the work at Tharangawa State High School, part of the success and the scalability and sustainability of that work was because we spent a considerable amount of time um, analysing our data and understanding what our current position was and visioning what we wanted it to be and very systematically planning and mapping out how we, we would bridge the gap between the two and make sure that we bring everybody along with us in a manner that would ensure that it would be successful, you know, not for one day, 
but for years um, to come. So with those schools, we're, we're at that point in time where we're actually looking at, well, what is our current story? What is the current outcomes and experiences of our students with disability? Mm -hmm. um, how are they faring in relation to their peers without disability? What strengths do we have that we can celebrate and what are the gaps? And also, what practices do we have in our school that we can start embedding this work into that will allow us to carry us from where we are now to where we need to be? Because inclusive education isn't just about you know, one particular practice or five particular practices. And when people ring our school and ask to come along and see you know, inclusive education in half a day or a day, I, it's that little nervous giggle knowing that you know, we'll barely scratch the surface of being able to communicate to those people about um, what it is we do because it's everything that we do. Mm. And it's embedded within every choice and every decision and every system and process in our school um, to make it successful. So for those schools, we're at the point of looking at, well, where is the strength of practice in our schools? How can we extend those, in those schools? How can we extend those practices to ensure that they are quality and inclusive for every child? Because every school has lots of good quality practices um, occurring. And inclusive education is then just about ensuring that those practices are actually inclusive of every child. So you, you can say we're a high performing school, but are we a high performing school for every member of our student cohort? Mm. So at those schools, we're looking at what great practices they already have, how we can stretch and mould those um, to be inclusive of everyone and to help carry this work. So it's in those very early days of being very considered um, about how this work is actually going to be achieved authentically, sustainably and scalability along, uh, long term. So what I want to get a sense of, and I'm going to ask you this as well, Ms Morris, in your role as uh, Acting Regional. Got that correct? Thank you. Um, I, I want to, I'll ask you Ms. first, Ms Wonka. Well, why, why could Thurungawa get to where it's got to? Okay, and you're allowed to say you, but, 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 I'd like to, but I'd like to know, because we understand that a really good head of department for inclusive services is absolutely critical. So let's just take that as a given. What else is it about Thurungawa that's able to bring it to where it is now, which might give us an indication of what's lacking or not there for some of the other schools? Um, that's always the question that everyone asks, um, hoping for, you know, the magic wand. Um, ultimately, it comes down to culture and leadership. Um, the short answer to that question, I often um, defer to um, my principal, who is very much a part of this journey, and I know that when he's asked the question, he defers to saying me. So, <laughs> um, together, I guess we have um, the answer. Um, but ultimately, it was a willingness, a willingness, um, you know, and a moral imperative within the key leaders of our school um, to turn this ship away from something that we knew was not right practice and to head into um, uncharted waters with nothing more than it being the socially just thing to do um, and strong leadership and skill to bring along a culture of a whole staff, you know, to walk with us um, into that unknown and down that journey, knowing that this is the important work um, and is the work of school improvement and is incredibly important for every child in our school. Okay. Ms Morris and Ms Capella both nodding. Um, I'll start with you, Ms Morris, in your role as uh, Acting Regional, but I will, I will let you have an opportunity to, to give your reflections if you wish as well, Ms Capella. So the same, why, why Bowen State High School is where we are in inclusion compared to other schools? Is that the question? Yes. I believe that it's about the moral imperative, it's about the willingness, the same as what Lauren said, it's about leadership, it's about shared and strong leadership. My principal, uh, we have the same shared belief in the rights of every child. We believe in the in inclusion we believe that every children can, child can succeed and but not only us so do our staff most of our teachers or that I know uh, have the same belief and always have had and are very proud to work towards that inclusion culture that we have mm. we have we um, are a school that does get a lot of beginning teachers and new new teachers and they're very proud 
as young people to work in, a, in an inclusive school. So they work very hard towards inclusion and have a, a really strong belief, moral belief. I think it's it, I think it is the passion of leadership, but it's the skill of it as well, Absolutely. to be able to, to bring people along with you. It's um, especially in, in being able to show the success. So right at the very beginning, being able to show the success of inclusion, the, the success of each and every student, helps to drive that and bring that and grow that in, into an even bigger and more successful Thing really, or inclusion, or a heart that that we've managed to develop as a school over time. Okay, um, Ms. Morris, any final observations on that before we break? I would just like to add that leadership and my principal, it's very much, it's our moral imperative, and making priority of inclusive practices. And I believe that we believe that every child can learn. Every child deserves the right to learn in quality education, the best that he, we can provide. And that the teachers, we have quite the different, we have teachers who've been at our school for a long time and teachers who may have even attended as students to our school. But through leadership and through this high will, that they want the best for our students. And we want the best. We want to be world renowned for inclusive practices. We're going to break now for morning tea. No, I want to ask oh, a question. <laughs> We're not going to break now for morning tea. <laughs> Sorry, just, just a question I, I want you to think about mm -hmm. over the morning tea adjournment, and I certainly don't want an immediate answer, but um, being a Queenslander, I'm aware of, and even my mother having attended Collinsville School, <laughs> So, right in this area, you haven't got necessarily the easiest cohort as students. There'll be uh, a number of students in your schools with behavioural difficulties mm. and some severe behavioural difficulties and some of that may be related to disability. So really what I want, to, uh, want you to explain is what are the strategies for dealing with that and does that have, does that change what happens overall in the school? Um, because that's always one of the areas of difficulty that talk, people talk about with incorporating students with disabilities where they have severe behavioural difficulties. Of course, not all students with disability do, but there'll be a small cohort that do and where that impacts on other students. So that's the area of them. I'm interested in that. And a related question to that, how do you deal with the parents of students who do not have disability mm. who may not be necessarily sympathetic to what you're trying to achieve? Can I just address that one particularly right now? Um, we were actually, um, you know, preparing ourselves for for that, for parents um, of students without disability um, to have some opinions. But um, to this day, five years later, we still have not had one um, contact to the school in regards to students with disability being in the classrooms of students without disability. Um, so very positive for our school culture. All right, we, we now will break. <laughs> uh, and it is now, according to my watch, 11.32, so we'll resume at 11.52. Thank you. Might I very briefly, 30 seconds, just indicate the plan for after the break, yeah. which will be to answer those questions just asked by the commissioners. Then you'll each have an opportunity for a few minutes to, to give us a summary of how your schools, what your schools have done in terms of the inclusive journey. Um, then I want to um, move to address the barriers and challenges that you're facing. And then I will be asking you for your wish list and also what you'd like to see this commission accomplish. Thank we'll you. We'll resume at 11.53. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, Dr. Melifont. Thank you. Um, so, Ms. Swancott, you had the chance to answer the Chair's question about um, whether there'd been 
parental or carer pushback of students without a disability for the process of inclusion of students with a disability. Ms Morris, did you have anything you wanted to say about that? Whether, whether, whether you had experienced um, situations of parents of children without disabilities um, challenging the, the decision to move towards inclusive, inclusion? No. No. Okay. And uh, Ms Morris? Ms. Oh. <laughs> Ms. Right. Copilla. Sorry. No. No. All right. So the other question was asked by um, Commissioner Atkinson um, in respect of um, uh, children with behavioural difficulties and the strategies around that. Who'd like to start? Um, I'm, ha I'm happy to. Um, beha student behaviour is obviously something um, that's on you know, the cards for all schools, and it's something that schools are com um, constantly reflecting upon um, and trying to understand how they can address better, obviously, for us. Um, our students with a verified disability, uh, once we transition to an inclusive education model, um, we've actually seen decline in their adverse behaviours. Um, um, they, you know, have better social um, role models in their classrooms. Um, they feel more valued and welcomed um, and therefore engage and participate um, at higher rates of achievement than what they did previously um, before we changed to that model. At a whole school level um, is how we address it and as I mentioned before that inclusive education at our school is about everything that we do so ultimately um, the answer to most of the questions around the work that we do starts at that whole school level. So for us it's about quality first teaching and the implementation of quality practices is what we would refer to at a tier one level um, and we're also a positive behaviour for learning school so um, a lot of emphasis around ensuring that the general operation and management of our classrooms um, is welcoming and inclusive of all of the students and that we deploy strategies at that universal tier level um, to address and meet the needs um, of the broadest population and then we can provide um, additional supports and strategies for students at tier two and tier three based on their individual circumstances. So for us, um, as I said, we're a positive behaviour for learning school. So that means we have very clearly articulated um, positive behaviours that we expect at our school. Um, we explicitly teach those behaviours weekly. Um, the behaviour of focus is delivered to the whole school first by the principal at full school parade on Monday. We then deliver an explicit lesson around that behaviour um, to the entire school population on Tuesday and it's reinforced um, and recognised across the week for students within all lessons. Um, in addition to that, um, we utilise strategies at, the, at that tier one that allow students um, to connect and build relationships and regulate their behaviour. Um, we've just taken on board what's called the Berry Street Educational Model, which is trauma-informed practice, um, which now results in many of our classes commencing um, with opportunities to connect in a class circle. Um, to check in with kids, for them to identify how they're going in relation to self-regulation, doing a little activity that allows them to build relationship with one another and the teacher and to set themselves up for positive learning then throughout the lesson. We utilise brain breaks um, within our lessons to ensure that regulation levels are maintained. Our lessons are 70 minutes long. Um, and then in addition to that, you know, in the other tierings, we have opportunities for students um, to check in and check out and do other strategies that are more individualised um, for themselves. So ultimately, the goal for us is to ensure universally that all students have the strategies that they need and that we're not um, constantly doing lots of individual things, that we're taking those common practices and ensuring that they're implemented um, across our school for all of our students because it's all quality practice for everybody. Ms. Bowen State High School is also a PBL school, so we practice the same tier PBL. one, tier two, Sorry. and tier three. PBL, PBL positive, positive behaviour for learning. Thank you. So we practice the same procedures. It's a whole school approach to behaviour. Uh, we have PBL lessons every morning in our form classes. The language of PBL is used through all our lessons. 
uh, the tier one approach that Lauren is talking about is in, at a classroom level. And the tier two and tier three, when the behaviours become more complex, uh, become a student <coughs> service process that involves guidance officers, hoses, year level coordinators, year level HODs, deputies and parents. So is that what tier one, tier two and tier three Yes, mean? yes. So it's a different levels of complex behaviour. Yeah. And then each child has a case manager, each child with a verified disability or each child identified as having needs, intensive needs or needs in behaviour, needs in attendance, will have a case manager. Thank you. So that will lead to yeah, the complex case management and from that we will, those decisions are made whether we need to outside support from perhaps a psychologist or um, medical behavioural, more behavioural support from regional. So those supports are in place and each child would have a behaviour support plan and that plan will be activated and shared amongst staff to follow the processes and strategies. Thanks. Thank you. Ms Capilla. We have the responsible plan for students' behaviour and we have a level as well. And we have a wraparound support. So we start with the whole school support. We have a support services team who include the CEC, the school nurse, the youth coordinator, a HOD of student services in student services and the guidance officer. Then we have my team, who are the inclusive practices team, and we have the school structure of a year level HOD with a year level coordinator. We then, if you imagine, it goes down through a hierarchy. We have then our cluster curriculum groups, our year level teams, and then down to the individual teachers. We too have a positive youth development program and we work on the habits of mind. We too are, have been to Berry Street with trauma and we're looking at um, for students for self-regulation and I'd particularly like to talk about a student who has Tourette's and has anxiety. And so the language that, you, that this young person may present, you may not find in a school ground as you would expect, however, his language that he uses comes from his disability. And we recognise at Ingham State High School that there are behaviours that students display because of their disability. And we work with family and we work with the teachers to recognise that that's where that disability, that's where that behaviour is coming from. How many students are there at your school? How many students are there? There's around 350 students that we have. Yes. And that's something I'd like to talk about later in my, my summer. <laughs> well, if Dr. Mellifon doesn't ask you the question, I'm sure someone else will. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Can I just talk yeah, about our training? Our staff do receive functional behaviour analysis training. Mm -hmm. And we are also um, have been to the Berry Street training, the trauma practice as well. The, the functional behavioural analysis training, is that an internal training program or an external service provider? It's a, a program that is part of our positive behaviour for learning and it's a regional uh, function or behaviour analysis which is used regionally as a behaviour analysis. Okay. I want to ask each of you if, um, to assist the Commission in starting to understand the types of supports that might be currently in place for First Nations students. Ms Swankart. Um, so at Tharangawa State High School we have a significant population of students who identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, um, around 42%, which is around 350 students um, in our school. So they are very much a significant um, population that are very valued um, in our community. So as I mentioned previously in another question, um, we have the federally supported CLONTAF and STARS programs. Um, they both come with a large number of staff that are there to support students to engage in education 
um, and also to support their families to engage in education. So they provide a lot of support to the students um, in relation to coming to school, the skills that they need once they're at school, but also about you know, building that cultural um, understanding, um, valuing that in our school community. Um, you know, and being proud of that, being proud young Indigenous men and young Indigenous girls, um, and ensuring, you know, that they have opportunities to connect and engage with their culture um, within our school as well. Uh, we also have a community education counsellor, um, which I mentioned previously on staff, um, to support in very similar ways as well and to work with staff around that cultural understanding and ensuring that we are responding to and engaging our Indigenous students as well and as well as some Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander teacher aides that are in classrooms with students. Okay. Yes, Morris. Uh, at Bowen State High School we have the Indigenous Community Education Counsellor who presents cultural awareness training for all staff. Our staff engage in English as additional language or dialect band scaling to produce individual support plans for those students. We have an academic Indigenous mentor who works with our senior students to support them in their senior pathway. We have Indigenous teacher aides who work with our stu Indigenous students in classrooms. We have a place called Bibigu Yumba, which is the learning place. And that is where students, Indigenous and non-Indigenous students visit. They have their lunch there. They, they get together and talk with the CECs and the mentors and different staff members. It's just generally a place where they can do their learning, catch up with each other, have lunch. We have lunch packs and um, breakfast provided there through our relationship with Gerardella. We basically partnership our lunch, the lunches and the, and the breakfast program. We have NAIDOC, an all day NAIDOC event that involves all staff and community members. We have a cultural camp for Indigenous and non-Indigenous students, which is about the Indigenous students sharing their culture with non-Indigenous students. And just recently, we've been involved in um, deadly, deadly choices. We're making a song about our their culture and their and their local community. Ms. Morris. So we have. Well, we'd like to have the question again, just so clarity. Yes, Ms. Kofiello, okay. what we're asking is um, initiatives and strategies in place currently supports for First Nations students. So they're embedded across our school in all our practices. But we have particular support for, st for students and we have a team that wrap around and support our students. And in this support services team, we have a HOD, who is a head of department. We have the CEC, the school nurse, the youth coordinator, and the school chaplain and the guidance officer are part of that team. We then have case managers at a case manager particular level. And as I said earlier, we are an arty school and we're working with bogs and we have people come up and we work in that section and looking at at how well they're doing in attendance and they've, they've just been away and had a great time together. And that has developed friendships and partnerships there as with the students. We acknowledge that we have Aboriginal, straight, Aboriginal and straight, Aboriginal Islander, Torres, Torres Strait, thank you. Because, and I'd also like to say we have South Sea Islanders at our school as well. That's what I'm trying to say. We have the Breakfast Club, we have Indigenous programs and part of our leadership camps and part of our camp is that we have um, the Gurigan Rangers who come and they talk about the cultural significance of the land that they are visiting and participating in, in their camps. And we have from a perspective, the Aboriginal and Islander perspective from regional where we have involved uh, people to come and speak to us about correct culture and correct protocols. Our literature is we have um, a very close, um, we have a writer 
and an artist in residence through the year, and his name is Monty Pryor, and he comes and he talks, does a wonderful job in working with our students. We then have NAIDOC celebrations, which our students run, and we invite the community, and it's a celebration. And we invite elders who we and to be part of, a, of our NAIDOC celebrations as well. But that, my, my brain just went, is that we have at every school um, event, we have welcome to country or acknowledgement to country. And that's where my brain just went there. And we have within our school a yarning circle where if we, we can go and sit at the yarning circle, and these are all embedded in our practices at Ingham State High School. You mentioned the school chaplain. What, yes. What's the role of the school chaplain? So the school chaplain works um, uh, as counsellor, and this is the she, Commonwealth. This is the Commonwealth scheme, is it? For chaplains in schools. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm just. From my perspective, she's a school cha chaplain and I don't know where she's funded from. So I have a school chaplain at my school and if I need counselling, assistance, she will go into classes and she will help. She will go with the CEC to home visits. She will also assist with um, activities. She'll be a person that may go on the um, ARDI program as a supervision and um, she's a person running the, working in the breakfast program, so yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, saw some nodding there from Ms. Morris and Ms. Wonkut. So this is this is department wide. Yeah, every, we have every a school, school chaplain as well. Yes. Yes, so do we. Okay. Is it every school or, or just some school? I believe so, but it's probably based on you know school size. I'm assuming as okay. whether you get one full time and that sort of thing. I think we may share ours with Collins. Yeah, we share ours is across. Yeah. Ours isn't full-time. She's not full-time. She works at other schools in our district. Okay, thank you. Um, before we move to each of you giving me a short, giving the Commission a short summary of um, the inclusiveness journey within your own schools, um, we have got a map. Now, I'll just get um, one of my instructors to, to just take it. To, oh, it's on the screen. Gosh, so technical. Okay, great. Um, so the the middle the middle area, the North Queensland region, which is it's actually there. It's already marked. Yeah. So that we sort of we sort of see a, a light yellow as opposed to a greyish colouring. So the light yellow is the northern North Queensland region. Correct. Okay. So can you just assist me, Miss Swancott? You are a regional um, head of department. Oh, sorry, regional... Uh, Hoses inclusion. Thank you. There Are there three people who hold that position for this entire region? Correct. Okay. And Ms Morris... Oh, sorry, Ms um, Copilla, what sort of school territory does Ingham cover? Well, we go from out to Mount Fox, down to Rolling Stone, out to Forest Beach, Lucinda, and to the base, see the top of the, there, that's the base of the Cardwell Range. Okay. So we go there, that's where our schools, our students come from. And Bowen? Bowen, I'm not really sure how far our school goes to. Um, we, well, we, there's Bowen and then there's Collinsville and then there's Early Beach, Proserpine, so they're all very close together. Okay. So some students, may go to a private school in Proserpine or Early Beach from Bowen and so it's hard to say just what our region is. It's a Whit Sundays sure. and we have students from anywhere within that region may come to our school as well. And is Thurungawa from the direct area of Thurungawa? Yeah, it's a, it's a suburb area here in Townsville. Yes. All right. Now, um, I'll start with you, Ms. Capilla, to give a summary of the journey of Ingham in this inclusion process, please. So we started with the QSIL project, and I came, there was two parts. There's QSIL 1 and QSIL 2. I um, won the position of head of department inclusive practices in the second section 
of CUSEL with the leadership. And then we, so I became along, then we were given um, a principal uh, who has moral imperative for inclusive practices. We then drove the inclusive practices at Ingham State High School and with the inclusive, the Departments of Education Inclusive Practices policy coming out gave us real direction and gave us where we were going. And this provided uh, the avenue for students to attend their local high school with the support, the reasonable adjustments required to work in quality education because at the same time the Australian curriculum was rolling out and the Australian curriculum then and the senior curriculum became quality education for all students. And so that was part of it. We started, we have ICPs which all work in that part as well. So we have a building and this building is a purpose built building with toileting facilities and kitchen and this is used by all students. So if students want a time, a quiet time, we have one side quiet and on the other side we have people practicing dance choreography. So we take we have that happen as well. We have sensory breaks, we have movement breaks and this is all built in part and we work together as a whole school and we work in the process of advancing inclusive practices. Before I, before I move on, can I just ask you this? Your statement says that Ingham State High School has not decommissioned the special education program. Can you explain what that means? So what that means is that on one school, you, when enrolling, and if you were a, a student who has a verified need through the EAP process, on one school, there is the box to tick for SEP. So the box is ticked and this assists with funding as one of the avenues for funding. And we have um, a special ed program ticked on one school. Okay. Now... And we, so yes, so these students then are, are without. It's not a physical building. The students are out through all classes. All right. Now, does that mean, though, that all students are in the mainstream classroom at all times for all purposes? No. At times, yes. It depends on the individual's needs. It depends on the individual that arrives at our school on that morning. It depends on the student, what has happened before, and are they ready for learning. So we have intensive focus teaching sometimes, and our priority is to be in classes, in pre-learning beside their similar age peers. So at times, yes, but um, the majority, full time, all the time, learning beside their peers. Okay, so sometimes, if I can summarise, sometimes the students will come out of the classrooms in order to have their specific needs met. But that's not just limited to students with disabilities, it's all students, is that correct? It's all students, yes. So you have general access, general areas that um, perhaps for chaplaincy, school community engagement officer, youth support coordinators, for example, which any member of the student cohort is able to access, is that correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and 100% of students graduated from Ingham in 2017 and 2018 with either a QCA or a QCIA? Yes, so a Queensland Certificate of Education or a Queensland Certificate of Individual Achievement and that's very much a Queensland part for the Certificate of Individual Achievement. It's about what the student can do and it's a very formalised process in receiving this what, what achievement. What would such a certificate look like? What does it say? So it recognises, so at the top, it says the student's name. It says that it looks exactly like another person, another person's QCE. It's the same format. And in under the five headings of curriculum plans that was designed in year 11, it states what this student can do and states, um, and it's collected of evidence. 
for them to use. And then I'll talk about at the bottom the statement of participation of what they've participated in at while they have been in the last two years of senior education. And can that serve as a gateway to tertiary education? Not that one in particular, however it could. And it's a rigorous event. So I have students who've gone the QCE pathway and this cho the choice, the QCE pathway, who've used then gone into university and are in, uh, do a bridging course to go into university. Yes. How is the introduction of uh, external exams going to affect this? A reintroduction after decades. So, Ingham High, we are at the front foot, as you would imagine. So it's called the Access Arrangement and Reasonable Adjustments, and it's called ARA, and it's from QCAA, and we're following, and we have a process, and we've been working, rolling it out. So starting, we like to start early. So in Year 10, set plan meetings, we've spoken to parents about what this will look like in their getting ready for formal and as a summative assessment and what's available for them. So we're, we're in that, we're right in the process right now. Did I answer that? Yeah. Would you like further information? No, um, I guess, I presume it might provide some added difficulties. Yes, so there's also statements on it that QCAA have talked about for rest breaks, um, where in the room located, if needing to, um, looking at the room, being at EM High, what does the sounds look like, what is it looking like? And so we're looking at the reasonable adjustments for that. Yes. I apologise to Ms McMillan for bringing up something different, but it just occurred to me when you were saying that that, that might yeah. provide an extra... Uh, so we, we're... Problem, we're, difficulty, hurdle. We're in that space right now and we, yes, we're working with, you, with people and we're at different various levels of the department in this area. Thank you. Yes. Ms McMillan is just informing, informing me that she's able to, in time, provide some formal evidence with respect to through the question your Honour's just, uh, Commissioner's just asked. Okay. Uh, Ms Capilla, just one final thing. Paragraph 15A of your statement refers to all students at Ingham State High School attending school on a full-time basis. Does that mean they're at the school at all times? No. So what happens on a Wednesday morning, some students are out at work placement they're doing traineeships, or there are students who have negotiated that on their timetable that on a Thursday and Friday that they are much better at focusing, better, less distractions early in the week and in the afternoon, in the, towards the end of the week that they would not be able to focus and easily distracted. So with the parents and through negotiation we've looked at off-site campus where we're looking at cert two in horticulture or following their own interests in personal um, looking at um, wildlife carers courses so we've looked at that as well. Ms Morris you're so nodding sorry. you're nodding you do that sort of thing as well at your school do you? No. No? Okay. Not at but the you're... moment. Not at the moment but um, we have before done uh, greener farming project and things like that in partnership with community. Okay, and so in your regional roles respectively, that kind of um, alternate means of education is something that's used from time to time? Uh, it's not really an alternative means of education. It's I'm sorry, a, badly expressed. Yeah, it's more of a quali qualification. Thank you. Yes, students engaged in school-based traineeships and, um, you know, organised work placement and that sort of thing is certainly something that features in senior schooling. OK. Um, Ms Morris, can you take us through your sure. journey at Bowen, please? OK. So, the SEP classroom, or the classroom where students with disabilities attended separate lessons than the rest of the students, or the other Bowen State High School students, was decommissioned at the end of the 2013 school year. So from the beginning of 2014 school year at Bowen State High School, all students with disability 
were included and continue to be educated in mainstream classrooms. This is supported through co-teaching, adjustments, monitoring of student learning and support staff. The school has a whole school approach to support student learning, including students with disability, which pro provides a continuum of support with focused teaching and intervention at each layer. Co-teaching is prioritised to provide support for students with their learning needs. Co-teachers teach in one classroom, equally sharing the teaching and learning needs of st all students through co-planning, co-teaching, co-assessing and co-reflecting. Co-teachers provide personalised learning programs for students in collaboration with hoses, case managers and parents. Within a mainstream classroom, all, all students access curriculum at their level on the same basis as their peers. This means that some students require an individual curriculum plan where they work at a different year level than their peers in the mainstream classroom. The leadership team, so Bionstair High School stopped using an SEP classroom at the, at the end of 2013 school year after key members of the leadership team attended the Queensland Government More Support for Students with Disabilities initiative, Quality Schools Inclusive Leaders One, a leadership professional develop pro, development program written and facilitated by Professor Le, Loretta Guericelli. The leadership decision was to align the SEP with the research and policies presented in this leadership professional development program on whole school inclusive practices. The leadership team actively attended the Queensland Government Quality Schools Inclusive Leaders, more support for students with disability program, which developed the school leaders' knowledge and understanding of inclusive schooling practices. This developed the capacity for leaders to understand where Bowen Stout High School was as an inclusive school by using a schooling rubric, very similar to the signpost that showed where you were and where you needed to go and what those next steps would be. And then we set up an action project to move our school from where it was to a more inclusive school. The action plan received consultation with parents, caregivers of students with disabilities and the Bowen State High School leadership team and whole staff. It included the planning for co-teaching and professional development with staff to co-teach. Teachers had been sourced internally in semester two, 2013, for the role of co-teacher in 2014. I was involved in the planning process through collaboration with the hoses, whose position I shared as point two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My involvement was to collaboratively identify the school's inclusive practices using the rubric and to collaboratively develop an action plan to propose our next steps in 2014. I was aware that the inclusive education model was to be implemented the following year. I was aware of the co-teaching model presented and had read the research that supported this as an inclusive practice to support inclusion. The teacher educational adjustment program allocation for the SEP was planned to to be used as co-teaching. So that allocation for teachers is what we use for co-teaching because that, that allocation is supported through the students' individual profiles and that's how we get the money. So we use that to support their adjustments through co-teaching. In 2015, I was then the substantive hoses. I attended along with the current principal stage two of the Quizzle Leadership Professional Development Program. This delivered a training program to principals, school-based inclusivity mentors, which is the hoses, and classroom teachers responsive to specific needs identified by schools who'd commenced their journey. The focus for Bowen Start High School was to enhance differentiation and inclusive practice in the school through co-teaching and to develop an online co-teaching training course for teachers. The principal supported the development of the training package by, pro by providing uninterrupted collaborative planning and research time. She also provided ongoing feedback to the mentor and coach at key junctures of the developmental phase. This training package is used today to develop the capability of teachers to co-teach in inclusive classrooms. 
There was some resistance from teacher aides that had worked in the SEP for their entire career. Their concerns were about being separated as a group into different faculties. The concerns were addressed through mentoring, supportive conversations and a willingness to give it a go. Regular meetings and support were crucial and the outcomes were positive, with teacher aides enjoying being part of faculty, curriculum faculties today. They use there as a point of reference for students to support to other teachers in their planning about their individual knowledge on, on the students that they work with and it's very, very supportive and teachers really enjoy having that, that, that support. That's about it, really. Okay, I wanted to ask you mm. a couple of questions before yeah. we move to Miss Wonka. The SEP classroom was decommissioned, as you've, as you've said. But what's happened with that physical structure? Is it used for something else now? Yeah, it's Bibigu Yamba. <laughs> <laughs> right. This is a learning place. Yeah, so it's, uh, it is also still used for, because it has a disability facilities there for toileting, that it's still used for that as well. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Each of your statements have this paragraph, substituting your own school name, but I'm not aware of any schools in Queensland or elsewhere where Bowen State High School was used as a model school in the decommissioning of its SEP classroom and the implementation of its inclusive education model. And I take it from each of you that you weren't using another school as a model for yours. Okay. So for the record, everybody's agreeing with that proposition. So I think this comes back to what we were discussing before, is really about you and each of your roles, together with the leadership team of the school, sitting down and working out how you were going to do it, as opposed to having a corporate knowledge box of information and as to how things have been done and were working in other places. Is that, is that correct? Yes. Do, do each of you see... Um, some potential benefit in increased information sharing with respect to implementation of the inclusiveness policy within Queensland? Absolutely, yes, absolutely. Yes? Yes. Okay. Do is, the, is the effect of your evidence that each of you, in effect, developed your own programs independently of anybody else? Yes, yeah, so in my personal circumstance, um, I engaged with a lot of research, mostly from the United States and Canada, um, around what inclusive schooling um, is and looks like and how it can be achieved, because this was also predating the UN Convention and sure. General Comment Number 4. Yeah. Um, so ours was born out of a place of um, a lot of academic research rigour um, that was conducted on my behalf to ensure that we were heading in the right direction. Mm. Each of you ind was... independently as well? Mine was, or our schools was, through the, the training that we did get through more support for students with disabilities, but it was also the research that was linked to that program as well, which was extensive and, be, and reading and, and understanding how that worked. It was a very extensive program, mm. and I, we still refer to the manual and books today to, um, to guide us in that direction. Mm. So at Ingham High, we engaged a critical friend when we started, and the critical friend was Dr. Loretta Giacelli. And so um, Dr. Giacelli came and spoke with the staff and started us on our inclusive practices journey, and we then went into the QCEL, two, the QCEL 1 and QCEL 2. So yes, and through leadership, having strong leadership and, and the vision for inclusive practices. So you're speaking there about Professor Loretta Giorcelli, G-I-O-R-C-E-L-L-I. Uh, is that correct? Yes. Oh, I am? Yes. Okay. Did I cut you off, Ms. Morris? No. All right. Can I ask you one more question before we, um, before we move to Ms. Swankart? And it's in paragraph 44 of your statement. And the part I want to look at is page 10. Now, um, This is where you're setting out uh, your beliefs about how well mm. Bowen's doing. 
can you, can you help me with this language? Staff use disaggregated student data. This is paragraph C. Mm. Staff use disaggregated student data, including achievement ladders, attendance, effort and behaviour to monitor and plan for all students, linked with subparagraph F. The school's achievement and engagement data is used to collaborate around allocation of resources to support students with a disability. Teachers, teachers interrogate and utilise student data to inform their teaching practice and plan for plus one for every student. What's that all mean? <laughs> 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 okay, so so it's the assessment data, it's it's the A to E data, it's their attendance data, it's um, behavioural data, is all used together to to collaborate allocation of resources. So when we're talking about behaviour and how we deal with the behaviour and the complex complexity of some students, it's that data that informs our supports and how we support those, those students you know, with complex behaviours or learning needs. We look, at, you know, we look at their A to E data and it's someone's not, you know, is getting a D. So what do we do about that? We need to provide supports. We need to provide focus and intensive learning. We need to provide adjustments. We may need some, some extra reading. They may need to go to a numeracy program. It's that, that way of, it, of using the data to inform support for students okay. with diverse learners. So you're looking at all the information mm -hmm. you've got for the student and yeah. working out yeah. what needs but help. What they need. Is that right? Yes. OK. Um, Ms Swanka, can you take us through the Thurungawa journey, please? Sure. So I was appointed to Thurringower State High School as the Head of Special Education Services at the start of semester two, 2014. Uh, up until that point and for the rest of 2014, the school was operating a traditional approach to the education of students with a verified disability. Um, and that was that they were accessing segregated classes with only other students with disability and were taught by teachers who were employed as special education teachers and supported by special education teacher aides. Uh, students did move out into the regular school to access elective subjects, but again remained as a group of students with um, disability when they did those um, classes. So when I arrived at the school in, 2000 and in the middle of 2014, the principal and some of the school leadership team had engaged in the first semester with that CUSEL program that you've heard um, my other colleagues speak about today. Um, and the principal was also relatively new to the school himself, so was also in a process um, of looking at and analysing the performance data um, for the school as a whole. And it was identified um, that in some circumstances, um, that that data was underperforming and that um, we needed to do something about the outcomes of students at a whole school level. But also that gave me the opportunity to review the data of the students who were accessing the special education classrooms and to seek their voices about their educational experience at the school. And that also indicated um, that they were underperforming in the data as well. So ultimately that... Sorry, Ms. Swank, I'm just yes. going to ask you to slow down just Sorry. to speak. <laughs> Right. It's usually me that's yeah. going too fast. So. Um, so that sort of was the precedence for us then um, at a leadership level to sort of look inward to our moral imperative and to, you know, the quality of education that we were providing, not only for our students with disability, but for our entire school, um, and come to the viewpoint that we needed to improve, improve that and to look for ways um, that we could make that happen. So for me, I've been in pursuit of inclusive education for my entire career, for all students that I've taught. Um, and in my previous school locations, have acted in leadership roles, where I was certainly engaged in doing, you know, tr attempting to do that at a whole school level in those schools. So coming with that background and having a principal that was saying, yes, we want to do that work, um, ultimately meant I, you know, latched on and said, yes, yes, we're doing this, we're going, going ahead with that. So 
For semester two, 2014, um, as I alluded to previously, it was very um, well thought out, very systematic process for us. Um, that's generally my leadership um, style. I like um, to ensure that what we're doing is evidence formed, is, is rigorous and has every opportunity to be scalable and sustainable um, across the school. So we spent six months, um, you know, working with a professional learning community, gathering the voice of students, the voice of teachers, surveying people to understand unconscious bias, their opinions about the education of students with disability, to really get a solid picture um, about the current situation in our school at that point in time, and then also to use that research to project and to imagine more beyond um, what we wanted and shift away um, from segregated classes. Um, so that evolved into the development of a school-based policy because at that time we did not have the department policy um, and an action plan to help guide us. Um, and then in term four is when we worked really heavily on forming a culture in our school that was inclusive um, to prepare us ready for the transition of the students at the beginning of 2015 out of those classes and into regular mainstream classes. So by the end of semester, two, uh, semester one, 2015, um, all segregated classes at Tharangawa State High School had ceased and all students with disability were now um, in regular classes across our school. Um, and all of our classes in our school uh, naturally have natural proportions and therefore represent the entire diversity of our school in every class. So on paper, every class looks the same in terms of diversity and demographic differences. Um, to support us in that process, it involved us um, innovating and iterating practice in relation to the use of our staffing, the way that we planned curriculum, um, the sorts of strategies that we were using at those universal levels, the intervention strategies, and ultimately offering multi-tiered systems of support within our classrooms to ensure that we would adequately respond to the diversity in our classrooms. Um, and make sure, as Catherine mentioned, that we were constantly monitoring data in order to ensure that we were providing the supports responsively that students needed and not waiting for students you know, fa to fail or to retrofit those things after the fact. And that sort of work has continued um, to grow and strengthen and scale across the school. Um, as with Bowen State High School, we utilise what was our existing or still is our special education resourcing to the school um, to provide co-teaching across 15 of our classes in our school this year. We pool our teacher aid resources that come from various allocations um, and disseminate them based on functional impacts at a whole class level. We assign teacher aids to a whole class um, and to a teacher and they are there to support the learning of all students in the classroom, as is the teacher is there as the responsible person in relation to the delivery um, of learning for all students as well. Um, so yeah, as, as you can tell, it's lots and lots of, lots and lots of things, lots and lots of processes um, that have continued to develop and gain traction. Um, also with the point, you know, that it's, it's never perfect. We're talking about over 700 students and 70 staff in our school. And so it's, it's always, you know, something we're always looking to improve. There is always work to be done and there's always things that we can do better um, and increase the fidelity and frequency of. So it's a constant journey. And I think if you think, you know, that you're there, that you've hit the de destination, then perhaps you're probably not actually doing inclusive education correctly. Thank you for that. Before lunch, we're going to... S oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to ask you about the assigning of teachers' aides to the teachers. Correct. Um, did that cause any angst in the parent group? No. So, um, as I mentioned, spending time, you know, in the culture and informing parents, that just came down to actually having explicit instructions about what that actually meant. Um, so when you just say, you know, we're going to assign a teacher aide to a teacher, a lot of us then walk away and make assumption about what that looks like. But having the opportunity to actually explain how that would operate and how that support would still occur um, for their children is when they become comfortable with understanding that. Okay. So we're going to start before lunch speaking about some of the challenges. Um, and we'll, we'll continue that after lunch. We won't keep you after lunch for too long, but we'll need, to, need you to come back then. Uh, can I start with you, please, Ms. Von Cutter? And I'm at paragraph 40 to 43 of your statement. 
and ask you to ex explain um, what you said in paragraph 40, which is uh, the Tharangal would benefit from the allocation of time in the form of additional teacher allocation, which would have a positive impact on the collective capacity for quality teaching and learning for all students. What paragraph number, sorry? 40. 40. Four zero. Yes, OK. Sorry. OK. But I just want you to, in your, in your own words, as you're happy to use them, uh, to explain to the Commission this challenge that is around teacher, teacher resourcing. Sure, yeah. Um, so in the high school context, um, Teachers teach a range of classes. So a high school teacher can teach in excess of 150 students in a week because um, they can be teaching, you know, five to six classes of students. So, um, and often across different curriculum areas as well, particularly um, in a smaller high school like ourselves, um, our sizing means that teachers deliver in a range of fa curriculum faculties. Um, so in order, you know, it is very much of my belief that every teacher does have the capacity to do this work and to teach diverse classrooms well. But in order to do that, um, you know, we need to build their capability and give them the time um, in order to ensure that they plan well to do that um, and that they're able to seek coaching and guidance in the delivery of it. Because it's not necessarily something that you just wake up knowing how to do, particularly as we're very aware that students with disability in regular classrooms might be something new for a lot of people and teachers themselves may have gone through schooling without um, students in their classrooms with them. So for me, um, you know, about resourcing is not necessarily about the actual resource itself, but the time that it can bring to allow us to operate in that manner. So, you know, for example, two extra teachers in our school would allow 32 teachers in our school to have an extra 70 minutes a week of non-contact planning time, which would then give them the time to come and co-plan with someone like myself for me to go and um, co-instruct with them in the classroom to engage in instructional coaching cycles to help model practice of how to deliver to the diversity in their classroom, you know, to ask questions, to problem solve. Um, because at the moment, non-contact time is three 70-minute lessons for our teachers. And again, they are teaching five to six classes, 150 students. So we need to sort of find the balance at some point where we're going you know, to value them as teachers and as professionals and as people um, with the value that we have of inclusive education and marrying the two and understanding that the two both need time um, in order for people to do this work well. Can I ask you about that a little bit more? And I will ask each of you for your comments on this topic before we move to the next. So we've heard, for example, of parents having meetings with the teachers at the school, and they might have an advocate with them. They might There might even be an allied health pr practitioner there, like an OT. Uh, and that's obviously all to help to plan for that particular student. So to get the teachers in, to that meeting, what, do, what does the school have to do in terms of making sure that classes are covered? Are you, do you have additional backfill capacity or is people kind of massaging and, and generosity of individual teachers? High school timetabling is an art and certainly not something that I'm <laughs> yet to have to delve too deeply into. Um, but I do know that we carry extra teachers in our timetable in order to ensure that we do um, have flexibility in our timetable to carry our own staff that are, you know, available to use um, to cover classes for those sorts of things. Um, but that's also impacted, you know, by staffing, um, teacher shortages, that sort of stuff. But then it's also the capacity to hire in relief staff um, as well, if needed. But ultimately, for those sorts of circumstances, the first point of call is with people like myself in the school would go and meet with those teams and collect um, that information and then I would go and disseminate to our staff um, at times that are appropriate. Um, but if it is something that we want all teachers to be at at the very initial meeting, um, then we certainly make that happen in terms of having them released off class to come and do that. Or well, we're very lucky that our teachers are you know, most often more than willing 
to stay after school or come early before school to engage in those sorts of things. And so in that respect, to some extent, you're relying upon the generosity of the teachers yes. and their, their personal time. Yes, but as a leader, very cognizant not to overuse yes. that reliance and, you know, to value and be kind mm. to our staff. Ms Morris, do you have an observation in respect to this topic? Do I have an, op an opinion? Yes. Yes. So uh, extra allocation for co-teaching is imperative to co-plan, co-teach, co-assess and co-reflect. Um, this would allow teachers to be able to personalise and attend to any learning misconceptions or lack of understanding of students on a lesson-to-lesson -lesson basis. I think that is what's really important is the lesson-to-lesson -lesson basis of presenting or delivering a curriculum and then doing your formative assessment and realising that there are students that don't understand and that you need to be able to go back and reteach and fo and have focus and intensive groups. And that happens can happen from a lesson to lesson basis. It's not something planning that you could do um, in the holidays and then, then that's going to work for you all term or on the weekend and it's going to work for you all week. There's that continuous um, needing to reflect and assess and go back and, and teach and ensure that every student succeeds. Uh, the whole school approach to student learning, which we talked about before as a policy, is a three-layered approach to differentiation, and that's with, with the focus on intensive teaching, and that's where it, it explicitly explains the importance of formative assessment and then those processes after that. Um, so the di uh, it diagnoses students' needs um, and that is challenging for teachers in a high school setting where, as Lauren said, they see students for three times 70 minutes a week and may teach a maximum of 150 students overall, including diverse learners. The reality, reality is that a teacher is generally on a full load of six subjects with three lessons, three lesson classes per subject, including three spares for planning and correction. This makes differentiation focused and intensive teaching for all students on a lesson to lesson basis unattainable even with a co-teacher. Building teacher capability to teach students with disability requires co-teaching to build, that's, this is more about co-teaching, but lack of time on a lesson to lesson basis and lack of capability has been recognised by, by teachers throughout ongoing consultation including surveys as a concern to their overall well-being. Thank you. Ms Capella? In the State High School, we have over staff because it's very difficult to find relief staff. So at the beginning of the year, we over staff. However, the staffing model for schools continued to lag behind the inclusive education model. For example, 12 students who are eligible for SEP allocation across various year levels, classes and subjects. And they're engaging in the Australian and senior curriculum with reasonable adjustments. The model of allocation of staffs does not reflect this inclusive model of practice and the resources required to deliver the curriculum in this manner. Updating the staffing model to reflect the reality of 12 students in classes across the school within 50 plus subjects taught by over 20 teachers would significantly assist in improving inclusive education. Updating the staffing model would assist with providing extra teaching staff. The extra teaching staff would assist with building the capability and capacity of staff in catering for students, co-teaching and supporting students with diverse learning needs. Additional or included in this model would be an extra staff member who could assist with replacing the classroom teacher when meeting with parents and other stakeholders. This would allow time for supportive teachers with evidence-based interventions and extra time requirements for meetings and development of resources for students who have disabilities. This would be additional to the non-contact time already provided under the Teachers' Award. Since we're into quasi-industrial matters, <laughs> I don't want to ask you about your union membership, but I do want to ask, do you agree with the position of the Queensland Teachers' Union on 
inclusive education? Broadly, no, I do not. In can, can relation you to just before we go on, can you and, and sorry, and I should just we should just um, make clear that in the res in your responses here, you are sp speaking as individuals, as right, as opposed to representatives of the department. Yes, I think yes. we could take that for granted. And perhaps could we just clarify which position <laughs> of the teachers union? No, I think there were a number that were advanced. Well, Only there was one that excited a couple of the commissioners. Yes, well, it was. Did you happen to observe Mr. Bates's evidence yesterday? I was here, but recalling every detail. I'm talking about the uh, policy statement of the Queensland, uh, the, the uh, Queensland Teachers Union. Which uh, deals with uh, special, with uh, special education and inclusive education. If, if you're not familiar with it, that's fine. Perhaps we can re what was his yeah, position? I think. Um, I just see that the time it is one o'clock. We yeah. might be able to, um, to to revisit this. Yeah, afternoon. that's fine. If you want to take some time to think about that or deal with it later, that's fine. Yes, um, it's two fifteen. Okay, chair. 2.15? 2.15. Okay. There's nothing happening in Melbourne today, so... <laughs> <laughs> yes, we'll resume at 2.15. Thank you. Dr. Malafont. Thank you. Ms. Swankert, um, your statement of paragraphs 42 and 43 speaks about there being inquiry, inquiry cycles that are being actioned with the support of the acting head of inclusive schooling. Can you tell me what that means? Yeah, so um, as I've alluded to in previous comments that um, the work of inclusive education at Tharangawa State High School is always improvement focused. Um, we're always monitoring the fidelity and the quality of the practice that we're delivering. Um, so in relation to these specific inquiry cycles um, in my statement, I'm referring to that we um, closely monitor the data of our students with disability in relation to their academic achievement, um, their school attendance, that sort of thing, um, and analyse that in relation to students without disability um, and do a gap data analysis um, to ensure um, that we're providing an equitable service in our school. So once analysing that data, we then um, go into an inquiry cycle where we can prioritise some areas that come out of that data as a need for us to act on and to improve, um, which then works us toward an evidence-based action plan around how we plan to address um, the gaps in that data, um, which then goes into action and review phases. So. Um, Generally, you know, semester or annually, we're doing check-ins um, around that data and setting up our improvement focuses. Okay. In the paragraph 43, you say that the biggest barrier and challenge to implementing inclusive education at Tharangawa State High School that you identify is time. More time is needed to invest in building capability to deliver quality teaching. And, which I understand, and learning through job embedded gradual release of responsibility processes, which I don't understand. Can you explain <laughs> that, can you explain uh, that uh, terminology Ms. for me? Cut, before you attempt to translate that into English, mm. um, would you, could you just slow down a little? Yes, please? yes, Thank yes. <laughs> um, um, so we know uh, through research that some of the most effective ways to build capability of teaching staff. Um, is to do it in the context of their actual classes and in the context of the actual students they are teaching right now. So we know that when teachers go away to professional learning that's delivered off campus, um, that it has um, not as significant an impact when they return to school into their practice and rarely scales from them to other practitioners in the school. So the most effective way to address that is actually to provide the professional learning um, alongside them in the classroom with, their, with the students that they're teaching. So in relation to this um, sort of an instructional coaching model process, 
or a knowledgeable other will work with a teacher in the school, identify a problem of practice or an area that they wish to build their capability in that directly links to the students they're teaching and the outcomes of those students in their classrooms. Um, and then they'll go through a mentee and mentor relationship where over the course of that instructional coaching cycle, the knowledgeable other shifts from being the coach to gradually building across to the teacher then picking up that professional capacity and be able to then independently implement it, allowing the coach to then go and work with someone else and even that teacher then to act as a coach for somebody else. Thank you. So, so part of that, if I can use my words, is uh, learning in an immersive way yeah, with somebody actually, else more skilled or more and experienced. And practically applying the practice then and there with the children that you're hoping to have the impact on. Yes. Um, Ms. Morris, I see you're nodding in response to that evidence. Do you have any observations in that respect? We use the same processes at Bowen High School. We use those processes for diverse learners. We also use them for teaching writing. We use them for our PED framework as well, that, that same immersion or instructional coaching cycle. I think I misheard you. Which framework? Pedagogical framework. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I know it wasn't PET. Um, Ms. Copilla, any observations in respect of the comments just made? Oh, we do this very much the same and we're very much into inquiry learning cycles as well and working within our professional development and having the, the opportunity for teachers to build their own capability through the inquiry learning cycles, yes. Okay. Mm. Uh, Ms Swankot, I'm going to work through the barriers and challenges you've usually identified for the Commission and, and ask for other comments as we go through. But then I will, I will come back to you, Ms Morris and Ms Copilla, for anything that we haven't already covered off, which is in your statement. Um, Ms Swankart, you've identified some current policies and practices that hinder the provision of inclusive education at Tharangawa. And, and let's go through them. The first is some difficulties in accessing some specialist staff in a timely manner and restrictions on accessing some of these services for students with a disability who are not on an EAP. First of all, what's an EAP? Educational Adjustment Program, so a verified disability, one okay. of the six low incident categories. Okay. And I think we've already discussed at some points throughout this week that a student might have needs but not sufficient to meet the EAP criteria. Correct, or that their diagnosis doesn't even align to any of those six categories. Okay. So can you explain, uh, just expand upon how um, this is a particular challenge, the parts in part A of your statement there? Sure, so the specialist staff, um, such as occupational therapists, speech language pathologists, physiotherapists, um, aren't located or based in all regular schools, so therefore if we require the services of one of those members of staff, um, we need to put in an application to access those services. So there is a bit of a delay, obviously, in that process. Um, of putting in that request. And also, many of those services are only available to come and support us with students who are verified and not with students who are not verified. Okay. Any observations on this issue, Ms Morris? No, I agree with Lauren. Okay. Ms Capilla? Um, at AIM High, we're talking about the EAP process. A student who has significant ADD or dyslexia or react active attachment disorder or mental health, e.g. anxiety, depression, they're not recognised in the AAP process as Lauren just said. However, at Ingham State High School, these students are catered for and their needs are met because we're an inclusive education school. However, these students' needs are not recognised through the AAP process, which one is the determiners of resources and staffing. And therefore, we are using the NCCD data. We have the data, we have the NCD tool. It exists. And if we implement this, the data would reflect the needs of the school and used to provide additional support personnel, for example, for full-time guidance officers or additional guidance officer and the additional resources required to support these young people with mental health issues. How, how do you use the data? I'm just trying to understand how, how it uh, plays out practically. 
So what happens is through the state process of the EAP with the six low incidents, as Lauren just said, we, we use that for verification and we then have staffed and resources on those students. So through the NCCD process, mm. the more students are recognised through Disability Discrimination Act and we record those. So at my level, mm. I don't know what's happening with the data with the NCCD and for resources, but I know what's happening with the EAP. Ms. Swankar, can I move to the next uh, issue you raised as a challenge, which is some specialised human, human and physical resources are located at state special schools, which contributes to restrictions around access and availability to mainstream schools. What's that mean? So that goes hand in hand with that previous comment where I mentioned that they're not located in regular schools. Yes. And so here in Townsville, the occupational therapists and physios and nurses are based in our special school here in Townsville. Okay. Any observations on that, Ms Morris? No. Okay. The next issue you raise is that the data collected for specialised health support taking place in the month of November prior to the school year in which the resource is to be allocated. And you have many students at your school that don't enrol until the first eight days of the school year. So that has fun significant funding implications for you? Yes, so right now we're submitting data around specialised health support needs for students for 2020. Um, but as I said, many of our students have, are yet to enrol, so I don't know if or what or who has specialised health needs to be able to submit accurate data on that now, mm -hmm. um, which means when they do enrol in the first eight days of school, some of that allocation has already been decided without them being included in that which then results in us having to approach the region um, for additional funding for those students instead of having them included from the beginning in that allocation. So does that create a time lag between yes, requests and... Yes, and a reduced amount of probably what they would have got if they were counted in the November take of the data. And are you able to give a sense of the, the time lag? Oh, no, I think uh, there would be a set date yeah. that it has to be you know, in by after that day eight period. Okay. Ms Morris, do you have the same experience in Bowen? Yes. Okay, and in Ingham? No, because we're a smaller area Stop. and we're working with the parents beforehand. Okay. All right. Uh, we've if, already... oh, however, sorry, okay. if we have a new student to the district, we will have that happen. Okay, thank okay. you. Now, we've already touched on the EAP verification requirements. We don't want to double up on that, but can I just um, ask this, Ms Swankart, you've identified that the requirements can create issues, that is, you might have parents experiencing socio-economic barriers, such as transport, phone access, medical costs and time when trying to obtain a diagnosis. That's an issue, obviously, for your school for my demographic, region. yes. Yes. And is, is it... Um, are you able to say whether or not it's more uh, problematic or higher needs in any particular part of your demographic? Um, not in relation to those cost aspects, but as um, we spoke with the Commissioner before about how disability is identified um, in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island communities as well, um, and how they identify and associate with disability also then has an impact because when I come and talk to a parent from a cultural background about needing to verify their student with a disability, that ultimately doesn't you know, mean anything to them, doesn't interpret well to them and there's no real understanding from a cultural perspective about that. So often they then choose not to pursue that, mm -hmm. um, which is fine of course. And also um, situations, even with parents who do understand the process, that choose not to have their child labelled or don't have the means to go to specialist medical staff to get specific diagnosis and that sort of thing as well. The problem with that for us though in the current funding model is that 75% of our additional allocation for students with disability is based off the number of students we have with a verification. Yes. But that's not necessarily re reflective of the number of students in our school who could meet verification, but for yes. those sorts of reasons I've just discussed, do not have a verification. Right, so to get your verification you have to have a constellation of a number of things. Yes. Including parent will, yes. capacity, ability, That's right. access, yep. 
um, a medical di- confirmation for some of the categories or you know further testing around speech language and um, intellectual functioning that sort of stuff so all of that stuff can be quite foreign as you can imagine to families and even more so to particular demographics of people okay in addition to that uh, re- regional challenges with having enough specialists to to do di- diagnoses is that correct um, I'm not certain in terms of the health department I do know that sometimes for our Um, students with autism um, who go on the waiting list to receive public access to paediatricians and psychologists that it can be at least six weeks Um, but again that's the health department not the education department yeah of course Um, and of course it has to fit the particular categories that are currently covered by EAP yes Um, the other thing I just wanted to ask you about this is you, you note uh, one of the requirements is that the data gathering process is centred on a medical model deficit approach. So why is that problematic? Yeah, so first of all, um, there has to be indication that there is a disability in one of those categories, which depending, as I said, on the category could be from a paediatrician or through school-based um, cognitive functioning tests and that sort of thing. The second aspect of it is then the school has to be able to demonstrate um, a significant impact that that disability has in the school environment. Um, and that requires us to talk about the impacts that the student has across curriculum, communication, social and emotional needs. Um, there are a variety of categories. And ultimately the whole point of the document is for us to sell, you know, how much deficit the child has, how, much, how many barriers they experience, how many impacts they have. There is very little scope in there to actually talk about the strengths and the visioning and the motivators of the student and it's always framed in that medical model, what do we need to overcome, what do we need to fix um, mind frame. As, as opposed to a positive framing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Ms Morris or Ms Capilla, anything in addition or, or no. any no. dissent on any of that? No. All right. Can we move then to the NCCD processes? Ms Swancott, you note some challenger, challenges include the expectation of high school teachers to frequently maintain records of provided adjustments for all students captured in the NCCD and the expectation of high schools to collect records. Uh, just explain yes. the challenge. Um, so with the nationally consistent collection of data, we need to identify students who we're providing adjustments for in relation to disability. Um, but not only identify it, but then also maintain records of us actually implementing and delivering those adjustments. So as I've spoken about previously, high school teachers can be teaching in excess of 150 students. Um, So being able to identify, plan for, record those adjustments, as you can imagine, can be quite time consuming. So again, it's not that it's beyond their capacity or beyond their will to want to do it, but it's back to that time factor. The other aspect then for the NCCD is we have to make a decision um, about the category of disability and also about the level of adjustments being provided. So in our high school situation, the student can see seven different teachers and each of those seven teachers could provide a different level of adjustment to that child based on their individual subject area. In PE, someone with a physical disability might require more adjustment than what they need sitting in an English class, for example. And so we have to take that information and that data from seven teachers and you can only submit one category and one level of adjustment for the child overall. So ultimately we have to um, average out the level of adjustment even though it might be higher in some subjects and lower in another, for example. And so then there's time in that obviously to go and have conversations with those seven teachers, collect that information, that data, sit with them to all come up with a consensus of which category and which level we're actually going to record that student under to capture the best picture of that student as a whole. Okay. Uh, Ms Morris or Ms Capilla, anything in addition or any point of disagreement? Yes, I agree with Lauren about the um, time that it takes, the teachers that it, that it involves, the amount of staff uh, and um, probably that more administration time is needed to um, upload the data and the evidence. Store the evidence, yeah. yeah. Okay. Dr Thank Melifont, are we, how are we going for time, bearing in mind we have some other witnesses? We do. We'll be about another 15 minutes. Mm. <coughs> uh, 
And Ms. Capilla, any dissent? Or, uh, we or have agreed? a process and we acknowledge that Thurungara is such a larger school than us, and, but we too go through the process of what was recorded by Lauren. Okay. Um, just want to couple of, touch on a couple more issues before I ask you the last question, which is which is your wish list, um, and that's obviously not the things we're already covered, yes. <laughs> uh, and that is um, Ms. Morris. And thanks for leaning into the microphone then, because we were having a little difficulty picking up. Excuse me for a moment. I think that the issues we've covered in our discussions mm. with Swan Cup covers off your main barriers and challenges. Yes, Are we yes. agreement on that? Yes, thank yes. you. And similarly, Ms. Capilla, I, I believe that we've covered off most of the issues, but one of the things that um, you identify is that your numbers are actually decreasing in your area and that, that creates its own challenges. Can you just explain that for us, please? So, um, Ingham State High School is located in the Hinchinbrook Shire. The population is ageing and decreasing. And as a result, the school's enrolment numbers are decreasing. However, the needs of students are remaining the same or they're increasing. The decrease in numbers of enrolment has implications for fundings. As a result, staff allocation, teacher aid hours and guidance office hours decrease. The school applies for extra hours and uses extra grant money to pay for these services. Inclusive practices is a priority at Ingham State High School and the school does exceptionally well with the limited resources it provides, it receives. However, additional resources, both financial and human, were included in the original allocation. This will continue to support the students in their local schools. Thank you. Do any of you wish to express a view about uh, the, the continued role of special education schools? And it's entirely voluntary. <laughs> no, not at the moment, thank, thank you. That's fine, thank you. Anybody? I don't believe they represent evidence-based practice for schools, but I certainly believe they have their place in the department at the moment, but I would like to see a shift from that over time. All right, thank you. I, and I can't make a comment. I don't have a special school and I haven't been to a special school in nearly 20 years. Okay. Um, we've heard some evidence this week about how an inclusive education can change the po positive pathways mm -hmm. in terms of access into, into employment, etc. Have you seen yet, because you've now had some inclusive practices within your own schools for a number of years, um, a diminution of students in heading into negative pathways? Are you able to speak to that? Yeah, I certainly think that we have a lot more um, students going out um, to work and further study now, absolutely. Um, the success of our students continues to blow me away year in and year out of what they're achieving. Um, we have a student um, doing a Bachelor of Science at university this year who was once taught in the unit um, with curriculum five years below his grade level. He went on to win the Physics Academic Award for our subject in our school and is now receiving high, dis high distinctions in that science degree at university. Um, I've got lots of stories like mm -hmm. that that I could go on and on and on about, but they certainly and at our graduation ceremonies at school, um, the students walk across the stage and share with us what they plan to do beyond school. Mm -hmm. um, and now every one of them, including the children with disabilities, and you wouldn't even be able to pick which ones the children are with disabilities, walk across that stage and share a hope of you know, future employment, travel and future study. Thank you. Um, Ms Morris? We have the same stories to share. We have 100% of our students receive a year 12 certificate. They experience work experience that they had never experienced before. They are involved and study vet subjects that give them traineeships. They are very active members of the community. Yeah, it's very, very successful in, 
in what yeah in their involvement in our school in, in, involved in the same process and the same successes as other students. Thank you, Ms. Capella. Would you like to just ask a question again? No, it was it was about whether you've seen uh, even anecdotally uh, influences on whether students who've now had this inclusive experience been able to take more positive pathways and I suppose importantly diverting away from potential negative pathways. Um, living in a small town, you meet past students and their families and they give us updates of what's happening. We hear the positives of what's happening, going to university, working, um, being active citizens. So yes, we do. We do see it, yes, positives. I just wanted to um, just clarify, so these are people with profound disability as well? And that there's no, do they move to sheltered workshops? Absolutely no. not. So the example of the student I gave earlier, of, you know, being in Year 10 Science, accessing foundation curriculum with autism and intellectual disability, now independently operates a bobcat for an earthworks company. So my particular interest, I think, given my background, is also the negatives, mm. preventing the negatives. So um, the evidence shows, or at least 20 years of hearing the stories, for me, has shown that uh, a bad experience of school can be related to then graduation into the criminal justice system and a bad experience of life. Do you have anything to say about the role of inclusive education in preventing those negative pathways? I think the role of inclusive education promotes a student's social wellbeing. I think that it, they become very much a part of a community. They experience work experience in the community. They make friendships, long-term friendships with people in their community. They are involved in the emotional, of the emotional, the economical success of their community. And I think all around that, that has a very positive effect against that path, that negative pathway that you're so talking about. So you'd say about. they're all protective factors for preventing yes. criminal offending? Yes. yes. Yeah, thanks. Right, Ms Swancott, what would you like to see moving into the future? <laughs> Um, so, as you've mentioned, we've covered off a lot of things that were on, on the list already and that are included in our statement. Um, resourcing, as we know, has come up many times. Um, but for me, as I said, the resourcing aspect is more linked to that time aspect around giving our teachers more time to do this work well as opposed to just, um, you know, more money and more teachers generally. Um, so I would like to see some more strict accountability around how current resourcing is utilised in schools. We know that schools do have a lot of resourcing and we're resourced well and you've heard today that we've been able in our three schools to utilise existing resources um, structures um, to do this work well already. So I think it's just more around accountability of the resources that we have um, and not necessarily a whole lot of new resources um, that we need. Um, I'd also like to see more rigorous moderation around the choice and appropriateness of just adjustments for individual students, which links to what we spoke about in relation to the NCCD. Um, so as staff, we're picking um, the levels of adjustment that the student receives, and that gets recorded, and that's ultimately linked to funding. Um, but again, my interpretation of levels of adjustment may differ um, from other people. So I'd like to see some ambiguity around that removed so that consistent C in the NCCD is actually consistent um, across schools and across states um, even, and that the decision of adjustments is actually what that individual student needs and not just something that we've decided that they need, particularly when it's incentivised through funding tiers as it is. Um, there continues to be issues with the roles and capacity of hoses and special education teachers. We know that those role descriptions have not been updated for some time um, and that they actually still dictate that we manage special education units, which, as you've heard from us, is not what our role is in schools. So I'd like to see that to be more reflective of the work needed to advance inclusive education. 
and simply assuming that special education practices automatically transfer to be able to lead and implement high quality inclusive education is short-sighted. We need to invest in building the inclusive capability of existing staff in those special education roles. Um, because it, as you've heard us speak about, it isn't as easy as just one or two practices in a classroom. It really is, you know, thinking and doing things from a completely different culture and a completely different mindset. So it, one just doesn't equate to the other. Um, I also think we need to continue to objectively consider all practices that occur in the system level. And as I'm sure you can imagine, a Department of Education in Queensland is quite a system with quite a lot of um, processes, um, just as we have at our own school levels to identify um, any unconscious bias and discrimination that might be hiding in plain sight within some practices that we have in place and some policies and processes in schools, because um, some of these can continue to perpetuate segregation and inclusion, exclusion of students without it really having that intent, but as a byproduct um, of the structure that they represent. And we need to be skilled and willing to identify such practices in all of their micro and macro forms. So as I've spoken about before, it, segregation within a regular classroom can very much happen. Um, and not just in those big obvious forms that we're used to using those terms for. So we need all people involved in the department to be skilled in seeing those practices clearly and to speak honestly about them and to then act decisively to address them in our schools. Thank you, Ms. Swankart. Ms. Morris. I would like to see a needs-based resourcing that increases the allocation of teachers and specialised personnel, occupational therapists, speech therapists and health specialists to support all students and teachers in mainstream classrooms. I would like to see a resourcing model where schools whose students require a greater level of adjustment and educational support to achieve learning outcomes on the same basis as their peers receive a greater level of resourcing. I would like this resourcing model to be national so that verifications are accepted from state to state. Having to get another diagnosis when moving to a new state is very stressful for parents and also schools. Can I end on a personal story Certainly. from this week? Our school received a call from a parent from interstate who needed, needs to move to where we live. They explain their child's disability in detail, which is very complex. The staff member explained that we're an inclusive school and all students learn together in mainstream classrooms. She explained to the parent that we co-teach and that's how the adjustments will work in the classroom. We will provide the adjustments through either co-teaching or a teacher aid. The parent then asked if we would allow her child to come to our school. The parent explained that they'd been told their child could not go to certain schools in the state they came from and was unaware if this was so at our school. The person taking the call felt a deep sadness for this parent. They replied that we're an inclusive state school. We accept all students regardless of their ability. Because it is their human right, it is morally right and because it is the law. The staff member explained that whatever your child needs, are at school, we will provide for them. That is what inclusive schooling does. Thank you, Ms. Morris. Ms. Capella? I'd like to see several things to come from the Royal Commission, including but not limited to the following. Continue implementing the Department of Education inclusive education policies with the review in 2021. Currently, schools are at various stages of their inclusive education journey and as a result, they should review or audit their current inclusive practices in alignment with inclusive education policy, using existing tools, for example, the signposts for school improvement. An audit or review will determine where they are in the journey and where to next. Secondly, provide assistance to schools how to become more inclusive with real examples of best practices, state, nationally and worldwide. Continuing to build the capability and confidence of the workforce to cater for the diverse learning needs of all students. Thirdly, recognising school cultures that embed inclusive practices and partner with parents, family and carers. 
a partnership with parents, family carers, with a student-centred focus on the individual's strengths and abilities. A process recognising parents are the experts of their young people and schools proactively working with families and young people for successful outcomes. Additionally, giving young people a voice, either verbal or electronic, for them to have a say in their education. Giving the students the ability, confidence and mental health and wellbeing to have a voice and choice of the life at school. The feeling of being welcomed and belonging to their local community and gaining quality learning alongside their peers. Summing up, I hope the outcomes from this Royal Commission find the continuation of the implementation of Department of Education Inclusive Practices Policy across all schools. Finding the best practice of schools, catering for the diverse learning needs of their students and partnering with parents, carers and families with the student focus on young person's strengths and abilities. Additional allocation of resources, human financial and facilities to continue to build the confidence and capability of a workforce to proactively cater for students with diverse learning needs in an inclusive, safe, welcoming school environment. And finally, student-centred education with the student's voice and choice to maximise their learning outcomes in quality education. Thank you. Chair, I want to share what I would like to see from the Royal Commission broadly. My I'm sorry. was about the department. No, that's okay. I didn't sorry. know if I was to continue with that part of my statement. No, well, please do now. And I'll, I did say that I would give you the opportunity yeah. to do so. No, that's, that's right. Um, so from the Royal Commission broadly, um, for students, I would like to see their rights forefronted and acknowledged in a national commitment to inclusive education across all states and sectors. I would like to see alignment of those rights in what we see, say and do, with strong monitoring and accountability measures to ensure that upholding those rights is not left to choice or chance, but that instead inclusive education is a genuine default level of educational experience in all of Australia's schools and one that is protected in legislation. For our schools, I would like acknowledgement that visions and objectives only have modest capacity to drive change. And therefore, we need structures that provide very clear and contextual professional knowledge, skill and practice directly across school thresholds and into classrooms with accompanying evidence-informed action plans and key performance indicators. We need to demonstrate exactly what this work looks like and how it can be achieved. Finally, I ultimately want to light a fire in all who are associated with education to dare to imagine more. We can't possibly be happy with what we are currently doing because history has reminded us time and again that the segregation and othering of diverse groups of our own humankind results in the most horrific outcomes which linger for many decades and transcend generations. We have known better for an awfully long time. We must act with urgency and do better. Thank you, Ms Longcott. Uh, Ms McMillan, did you wish to ask any question? No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for coming and giving evidence and thank you for the thought that has gone into your presentations. It's a great pleasure and privilege to hear from people who are so passionate and committed to the profession to which you belong. Thank you very much. Our next three witnesses are three principals. It might just take a little bit of time in terms of logistics. Might we have an early afternoon break for 10 minutes? and? I resume at 3.02. How could we possibly resist? <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> yes, Dr. Mellon. Thank you. I call Pamela Pritchard, Judith Finolio, and Grant Allendale. Thank you. Thank you for your attendance. Uh, if you would just follow the instructions of the associate about being sworn or affirmed as you wish. I solemnly and sincerely I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give that the evidence that I shall give will be the truth will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Please sit down. I solemnly and sincerely 
I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give will be the truth will be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth thank you very much please sit down I swear by almighty god I swear by almighty god that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give will be the truth will be the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Yes, Dr. Melifont will now ask you some questions. For consistency, we have situated to Thorongal, <laughs> Bowen, <laughs> and Dingham. Um, your full name, please, Mr. Dale. Uh, Grant Allen Dale. And are you the principal of Thorongal State High School? That is correct. Did you uh, commence in that position in an acting role January 2012 and then permanently appointed January 2013? Yes, that's right. Uh, we have your CV and we thank you for that. I won't go through all the details of it, but um, in short terms, you've been in teaching for a significant number of years now? Uh, yep, that's about 35 years. Okay. And that's in acting principal and principal role since 2008 to the current time. Kerwin Air Tharangala. Uh, that was a small role at uh, Kerwin State School. Okay. But probably my journey as a acting principal began about uh, 2010. Okay. And that's at Air? Sorry? Is that at Air? Uh, yes, at, at Air State High School. At, at William Ross State High School for about uh, five terms before that, uh, six months at Air State High School acting for a year at Tharangau State High School, then permanently appointed there in 2013. Okay, and um, you've also uh, taught in London, that was in 1990. Oh, that was a travelling backpack holiday, but there oh. was a bit of teaching that happened in London there as <laughs> All well. All right. I probably shouldn't go into those details. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps that's why the word casual appears in brackets after Casual was an important word there. Yeah. Where did okay. you stay? In London, right in London. In part one. If you had a tip about accommodation. <laughs> All right. Now, you hold a Bachelor of Education. That's correct. Okay. From South Australian College, Adelaide in 1984? Uh, 80, uh, 84, yes. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, now, Ms. Fenoglio, your full name, please. Judith Ann Fenoglio. Thank you. I'm not so good on the pr pronunciation, it seems, today. Uh, you are currently employed as the principal of Ingham State High School? That's correct. Okay. And you also have had a, a lengthy um, career history in, in teaching? I have, interspersed with um, opportunities in the corporate world as well. Yes. Um, you have a Bachelor of Education from James Cook University? I do. Thank you. And Ms. Pritchard, your full name, please. Pamela Therese Pritchard. And are you currently employed as the principal of Bowen State High School? I am. You've done a Bachelor of Education at James Cook University? That's correct. And how long have you been in teaching for? Um, around over 20 years, 24 years. All right. I want to start with a topic we haven't talked about at all so far this week, and that is um, the existence or otherwise of a complaints process within your school. So if you have a student or a parent or yep. a carer who has a complaint or an issue about how their student with a disability is treated, what's the existing complaints mechanism? Who'd like to start? I'll start if you like. Thank you. Um, we have a brief where um, we communicate with parents that in the first instance, if they have some sort of a complaint, depending on whether it's of a curriculum or a teaching and learning nature or a different nature, then their point of entry would be different. If it's a uh, curriculum teaching and learning um, issue, the first point of call is always the classroom teacher. Now that's no different for a student with a disability um, than any other student at the school because every student is connected to um, classroom teaching and learning. So that the parent, first of all, approaches 
the teacher requests an appointment or a conversation or some sort of interview to address that problem. If it's um, a, a behaviour or an external to classroom, then the parent will contact the year level coordinator. We have one for each year level. Um, and all of the details of these people are published in the student learning diaries. So that I'm going to get you to slow down a little bit. I am so sorry. Yes. Right. Yes. So um, the student um, learning diaries have the contact details for the relevant people, whether it would be a teacher or a year level coordinator. If there is no satisfaction there, um, then there is an organisational chart. So it would proceed. We have year, we have HODs who are responsible for year levels. And a HOD is a head of department. Head of department, I'm sorry, yes. Um, and then above that, one deputy principal um, looks after year 7, 8 and 9, the other 10, 11 and 12. And likewise, each deputy principal and myself have curriculum portfolios that we line manage. So if it's around a teaching and learning issue, it would travel through the curriculum line. If it's around um, a social and emotional or a behavioural issue or something that happens in the playground, then it would travel through the year level coordinator, year level HOD line. Okay. And what happens if it can't get, can't get resolved within the school? Where to then? Or doesn't that happen? Well, that is a rare instance, mm -hmm. um, but we do have occasion where um, North Regional Office will be contacted um, and then I will work with the peer personnel down there and ultimately though, it will come back to me and I will pursue it until I can address the issue. Just trying to understand what that means. When you say ultimately come back to you, does it come back to you with a direction, with a request from... It would be a collaborative conversation that I would have. Um, I would outline the steps that I have taken mm -hmm. um, and what I see to have been the successful outcomes in the areas that need further, further work. I would get some mentoring perhaps, um, access some professional support, a support if it's around a particular, if it's with a student disability and it's around a particular behavioural issue, maybe get some medical expertise or something, and then reinvestigate um, the solving of the problem with the parent back at the school-based location. All right, thank you. Ms. Pritchard, what's the complaints mechanism within your school? Yeah, we would mirror um, Ingham State High School, High School very closely. Um, and if it can't be managed at that classroom level and it goes through the year level coordinator, um, a student with disability, um, and it's the same with a, with a student without a disability, and it goes to a head of department. Um, but the head of department may then call on the head of inclusive practices or in the head of inclusive schooling, our, our HOES, um, to provide some support as well, because gen generally our HOES has got a really great relationship with the parent and has got some extra information that a curriculum HOD may not necessarily be privy to. So our head of, in head of um, inclusive schooling would be included in that complaints um, process. Okay, thank yeah. you. Mr Dale? Uh, exactly the same process. Uh, complaints are, uh, are dealt with by the most appropriate person in the school that has the information uh, about the event or the activity or, or the student to, uh, to, to help get a, a resolution with the parents. Um, same aspect as well in respect to complaints that uh, aren't resolved at a school level that may go to regional office, but it should be noted as well, some parents uh, go straight to regional office rather than coming through the school mechanism as well. Most complaints at schools are, are resolved in, in some form at schools though. And the circumstances where the parent or the carer has gone direct yep. to regional office, how does, how does the process then work? Uh, same process, the regional office makes, uh, makes contact with the school principal mm -hmm. who will make a decision about who's the best person to, to handle the, the complaint and to uh, investigate the, the, the issues. Um, uh, along the way that will, that will be dealt with then, uh, if, if needed, uh, as a principal will be involved as well and uh, will notify regional office that the matter's been resolved to a satisfactory level. Thank you. I want to now move to the um, importance of uh, parental involvement and as you heard this morning these questions are not directed to be a criticism of any parent because we know there are challenges for, for some parents and carers. But I do want to understand from each of you um, the importance 
of having uh, par parental engagement in the journey of the student at the school and when you don't have that, the challenges it presents. Um, is, who's oh, like, I'm happy to speak to it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's absolutely vital um, for the success of the student and that parental contact should never be a one-off, so it's a continual progressive contact um, that we have with our parents and that can be from our teachers from in, in the classrooms to our heads of department to our year level coordinators to our deputy principal but that contact um, is, is regular and, um, and it's for both positive um, feedback and also for concerns that we have but that's how we all get to know the students at our school it's, it's, it's really important. Okay and when you don't have it? It, it does. It makes things more difficult. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and how? Um, well, you don't get that holistic picture of, of the student and it takes us, it just takes a more lengthy time period to get to know that student and you could have done, done that more effectively in a shorter time period, that's for sure. Um, but our teachers, and, and as, as has been shared previously, our teachers do uh, make that very important to get to know our students. And, and develop those really strong relationships with our students. How do you deal with delicate issues like separated families? Families where yeah. the parents are separated, for example. So both parents are important regardless of their marital status. So... Mm -hmm. How do you deal with it? See them together, separately? Separately, yeah. yeah. And sometimes they request that they see us together as well. Um, Regardless if they uh, if their marriage has ended, um, depending on the relationship between those parents, sometimes they will request to see them together because that's how they're parenting together. Yeah, Mr. Dan, uh, they're very similar as well as what um, Pam was saying. Uh, the, the parent and, and offer an insight into the home life, uh, into aspects of the uh, the student that we can't see. Um, it's about getting that holistic picture of the student and so we work really hard to get that parent involvement. Uh, staff work extremely hard to make contact with parent. It, it, it is difficult at times. Um, staff can, can, with some parents, staff can make multiple calls, emails. Uh, we have systems in place where we, do, if we can't get contact via email or via the phone, that we do home visits um, uh, to, to homes to make contact with parents there. Um, it, it can be a real time-consuming activity actually to make that contact, but as, uh, as both Pam and you said, we really value that contact and so we, we strive to get it. Okay. It's important, um, especially in specific instances, where we need the communication channels between home and school widely open, because it may come about that you need to um, flexibly allocate resources for a limited period of time for a student who is dealing with a certain issue at a certain time or something like that. And unless the communications are open between home and school, that can be hindered and become complicated for the student's engagement at school if we're not meeting the needs that they present with on any one particular day. So, um, yeah. And I'll just say one more thing. I think it's important that we understand that sometimes the school requests that communication and then sometimes it's requested by the parent mm. because it goes both, both ways and that's important. Thank you. Um, this morning you heard um, you heard evidence, obviously. <laughs> You've been sitting listening to Miss Capilla and uh, Miss Swancott and Miss Morris in response to some questions around supports and, and mechanisms and structures to assist First Nations students. Was there anything in addition that you wish to add to the evidence we heard this morning about that within your own schools? I think the celebration of culturally significant events and the celebration of culture and a variety of cultures goes a long way to supporting um, the diverse range of students that we have in a school to feel belonging and to feel accepted and able to achieve. So we are registered with the Arty Academy. Um, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a school that doesn't put their hand up to get any extra support that they can get, particularly in cultural type type um, matters. So I advocate for community involvement to support us in this role for as much as we can get it, particularly in my community. Okay. What might that community involvement look like? Um, I was 
in a position where I could um, reallocate some funding recently to work on developing an initiative for young Indigenous boys, um, particularly boys who were in year seven and eight. At that particular time, um, we were having some challenging behaviours um, regarding young Indigenous men. And I was set to work on a project to um, track their pathways um, and see if we could do something about stopping a pathway that ended up um, in a local, in an organisational institution here in Townsville. So we had a, a diverse group of community representatives, elders, knowledgeable others, uh, professionals who identified with the Indigenous culture, come together to write a program of activities to engage these young men, to put them on a positive path for the future. So that sort of community engagement is invaluable. Um, unfortunately, it's always relying on volunteers, uh, like-minded people to come together and give up, give up their time mm -hmm. and source funding wherever we can get it. Yeah, and and was, it, um, was it successful? It was successful for the life of the time. Mm -hmm. um, now, now, what I say next is not meant to be interpreted as negatively. Mm -hmm. However, as, as um, Jewel Ann spoke earlier, my school is declining in numbers mm. and due to a reduction in staffing allocation, I could no longer attract a staff member to take on that portfolio. I'm, I'm just wondering about what the cost of that staff member would be compared to the cost of keeping over, open a juvenile detention <laughs> facility by the state government to house the children who didn't have the advantage of the program, but maybe that's a matter Miss McMillan could take on notice <laughs> for a later time. That's the line of thinking we were using. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. Uh, Ms Pritchard and Mr Dale, anything further on this topic before we move to the next? That is community, community, the importance of community involvement um, and uh, any other initiatives. I support totally support that nations. community involvement is, is essential. Uh, it is difficult sometimes as well and that's why for our school with a uh, large Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population of, of over 300 students using the, the, the STARS and Clontar Foundation as Lauren discussed before has been a, a way to engage parents um, that may have or may not have had a successful experience themselves at school, back into schooling again. And uh, both those organisations run events for, for students and parents, and we just sort of mosey on in as well to, to make those connections that uh, we don't necessarily had had beforehand. Um, to, so that's a really beneficial way. And as Jude said, uh, celebration, NAIDOC's a, a very big occasion at our school. It is a, a, a fantastic event for uh, our, our school and our community. Um, and I suppose the other one that uh, all schools are involved with is, as well is, is creating opportunities to role model Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students uh, to make not only them proud but their community proud. Uh, that may be through uh, Indigenous leaders. Uh, in, in our school situation, I think pretty close to half our whole school leadership team talking captains and student council members are Indigenous anyhow, so um, we all always looking for opportunities. Thank you. Anything yeah, we just did a lot of work around a cultural transformation of our Indigenous students and that's increasing their profile in their school, a sense of belonging and pride in themselves and pride in their culture and being able to share that with, with all of our students and our students, um, all of our students are very, very interested in learning about the First Nations mm. culture. Um, so we did a lot of work around it, um, increasing the profile of, of our Indigenous Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. Thank you. Ms Millie, I want to ask you a question. Um, you heard this morning I asked a question, Commissioner Atkinson asked a question about um, the ability of for inclusive education to promote uh, positive pathways and to divert from negative pathways post the school years or even in the school years. Can you assist us with your observations in respect of that, please? Particularly with, in, within the area of inclusion, I think um, having students work alongside peers, especially in the senior years, I'm talking about year 11 and 12 here, which are thought of as the years when you launch into whether it's going to become employment or further tertiary study, um, creating an environment and a self-belief that um, the world will be positive 
and engaging them in a senior education where they are actually achieving and seeing how that this education can be a stepping stone to a positive future. So if I fear that if students were in a segregated model, they would not be able to engage in the um, opportunities, um, it broadens scope of their world and become active citizens in the true sense of the world in that they had been exposed to a diverse group of people going through school, maybe exposed to traineeships and um, work experience or you know school clubs and things like that. Um, and so that for them would be a mirror of a community that it could be. So once they've launched from school, they've actually got a foundation or a scaffold to reflect back on and, and see and just role model how people had actually engaged with each other and um, models for making choices because ultimately the negative pathways are the result of a choice in that direction. So supporting students to make positive choices based on their education and their school experiences I think would help to keep people from going down that track. The evidence that this morning and this afternoon is of programs that are very successful. Um, we live in a world where at least governments like to have objective measures of success. How, how do you measure the success of your programs, or do you? That's a very difficult one. Systemically, we can measure A to E data, the academic um, results of our students. Um, we can track behaviour data to see about the encounters that are happening in the classrooms at the school. And within Queensland, we also have what's called the next step, which tracks the data of what students are doing with their lives the year after they've finished year 12. So that can be useful. It also gives us contact details, because these are details that we get voluntarily from young people once they've finished school. So we have those to refer back to. Um, in terms of any so data is, longer... Is that material published? Um, it's published on my school website at the end of every at the end of every data collection point. It's available there for people to see my data specifically what's happened in my school. Yeah, you, you can also track attendance and the increase in attendance of, of, of our students, um, especially our students involved in those programs and the retention of the, of our students. We keep our students right through to year twelve, mm -hmm. so we track attendance and retention rates as well. Thank you. And how have they varied over the last few years? There's a continual improvement, pattern of improvement. Is that true of your school as well? Uh, with it, with attendance? Yeah. Uh, not, no, not necessarily across the whole school. Attendance is a, a difficult challenge for us at the moment. Uh, it, it is, um, with the diverse range of students that we've got, we're working hard on attendance. Uh, I was going to add to that um, work we're doing with engagement with students. Uh, the, the key is keeping students engaged with something that they enjoy, something that they see some mm -hmm. purpose in. And I think we're all looking for, for uh, programs and activities that, that will give students some real sense of purpose, some real engagement, some success along the way. Uh, when we're talking programs, I'm, I'm always careful. I, 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 there's not a program or a book that you can do and that's going to be the solution. I, I think that the key thing behind any program is the human resource aspect of it. It's the quality of the person delivering the program. And I think we've always got to remember that. And that's what we probably work on as, as principals, is building capacity of, of our teaching staff to be the best possible teaching staff that they can be so that they can have the maximum effect for students. And if we look specifically at students with disability yep. within your schools, uh, are there measurements of the kind that you've described that uh, can uh, track uh, success or otherwise of particular programs? Uh, Lauren started talking about those as well. There are definitely some, some measures there as well. Uh, that ranges from attendance to academic data as well. I'm just going to get a nod from her over there in the corner as well. Yep. I think you've got a nod. Um, do each of the school's websites have this information? Sorry? Do each of the school's websites have this no, information? No, that, that information isn't uh, publicly available on websites. So. Thank you. The, other thing, the other thing that we have seen, uh, and I, we always talk about education, is the key is the transformation or the change in our society's uh, attitude, their, their behaviour towards our children with disability, um, and, and our society or our local community is changing. Um, our partnerships with our, with our businesses um, 
in Bowen that's changing the, the enormous support that we receive for them for our students with disability is overwhelming and they're proud of it. They advertise it on their website, so it's seen on their websites as well. So I've seen the change um, at Bowen, in the Bowen community with that, um, starting with education, but a change in community beliefs and understanding and appreciation of diversity in students with disability. Yeah. It's something I want to come back to in a moment. Did I cut you off though? Did yeah, you, I, you want to say something about that? No, no, that? no. I, I just, um, I was going to pick up on attendance. Um, if you look at the attendance data at Ingham State High School, it's very good. Uh, that's because we don't have any malls or any shopping precincts or any fun <laughs> parks. Um, so if you don't come to school, you don't get to engage with your peers. You think we should so recommend our focus the closure is... of Flinders Mall? <laughs> it limits their opportunity. So our focus is on engagement in the quality programs that, um, that we've got on offer. Okay. I, I don't know if we can really recommend the closure of all malls around Australia. <laughs> it's an idea, but I'm not Just sure. Just from nine to three. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess I the only I thing question, I, I would just—I was just curious about the comparison of different socioeconomic groupings and the diversity mm. groupings, you'd have to be comparing apples with apples too, wouldn't you? Yes. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah. There's, and you, you're not all the same. No, we've no. got varying percentages of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, students with disability across our schools. Mm. What, 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 sorry, what, what are the differences? So Grant's well, got... My, I've, my school, I've got a, about 40% of students uh, identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. I've got seven percent of students that uh, uh, students with disability. Seven. Seven, mm -hmm. um, which is about fifty students, and I have a hundred and seventy students on the NCCD data, which is about twenty three, twenty four um, percent. Probably the the other factor that I have is that a, it's a low socioeconomic community. Uh, we're in the fourth percentile of uh, schools across Australia. Mm. Um, a, a low ICSEAR number. Now that would include some of those students I just mentioned as well, and, and others. So, and I think there's a huge impact with the socioeconomic factors on, on schooling, on engagement as well. And each of the other schools, what's the Yeah, so twenty percent Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, five percent disability. Similar numbers for NCCD data around one hundred and five. So similar to to Grant School to Tharangawa. Mm. Yeah. My percentages are very much the same as Bowen. It seems to be proportional to the general population, so it mirrors that. Um, yeah, nothing, nothing different. Um, we find that being a small community, though, there's very much um, community ownership of the school, and in that way, parents and caregivers um, um, take their right of access and actually come in and have conversations with us around their their issues and their problems, probably more so than what Grant would be I'm able to experience it. because it's in a larger location. There's also the effect of mobility as well with people moving in and out of yeah. the suburbs and the community which uh, doesn't give them that connection to the, the school or the community as well. It sounds as though your community is a very tight-knit community. Yeah. I'm going to remind everybody to slow down for our interpreters. Sure. Thank you. And can somebody just give me an indication? Is that middle mic picking up sufficiently? The sound of a down pad. So much need to lean in. Thank you. Now, you've each spoken in your statements about um, can I call it self-assessment or reflections upon um, progress with respect to inclusion. But what I really want to understand is, are there departmentally mandated self-audits? And what are they, what are they? I'll Listen probably down. probably start with that. Uh, the department is very much part of the journey with our, um, with, with inclusion, of course, in schools. Although the three schools here started the journey a little bit earlier than the department's policy, uh, everyone's on the, the same journey now. Uh, uh, in respect to auditing, there's, there's probably uh, two or three types of uh, areas that, that occur that, that I know of, and, and one would be uh, from a school-based 
situation, and that may be through something using a, a, a checklist. Uh, the, the signposts for improvement is one of those checklists mm. that schools can use to evaluate where they're currently at and, and their, their next step. Um, and that signpost checklist you speak of is a departmentally issued tool? Th that's a department tool. Yes. Um, the, the second one I would say um, would, would be a, a, a regional audit and, and that would occur through where all everyone's got a boss. Um, we've uh, got uh, assistant regional directors that, that work with us, uh, that, that have a, a number of schools that they work with each and, and they meet with us and that's part of the agenda about how we're, how we're working with students and, and how we're catering for the needs of students, um, for, for all students, including students with disability. And I'd say the, the final one is every four years, uh, schools are, uh, go through a school improvement uh, unit review, and, and that's a good chance to have external people come into the school and, and do an evaluation of all the programs in the school, including um, uh, inclusive education. Okay. The middle one you mentioned, that is the meeting, uh, does that involve looking at hard data or is it a, is it a discussion? What is it? It, it's, uh, it definitely looks at hard data. Um, data sets are, are available uh, ranging from everything from uh, attendance to behaviour to uh, levels of achievement in, in class um, to, to NAPLAN data to senior data. Um, so that, that forms the basis of, of the conversation. The idea once again is that uh, assistant regional directors uh, get to know the school and have an understanding of the school. Um, they can see the progress. Uh, there's classroom visits involved with that. There's conversations with other heads of department and school leaders, as well as, most importantly, with, with teachers and with students as well. And how often does that happen? Uh, they happen, um, it, it varies from school to school. It's a little bit differentiated. Uh, but we'll about for your school? For, for our school, our school is uh, twice a term. Okay. In a in a regular term, about twice a term, and and available on need if, if we need them. Okay, Ms. Bridgeon. Um, so school improvement is based on the school improvement hierarchy, which is the nine domains, and we all work within that hierarchy according to the nine domains, and we align um, school improvement to those domains and work within those domains. Um, we use this, the signpost for inclusion as well as a reflection tool, but that's exactly what it is. is it is a tool. It's not a mandated auditing um, device or process. Um, and we use that with all staff, and that's including auxiliary staff as well. Um, and then at our school, we have class action plan meetings where I meet with our teachers twice a year and we work through, um, they present to me what strategies they're using um, to achieve a plus one, and that was mentioned before, that's an improvement strategy for every single student in their class, across their classes. What's plus one mean? Yeah, it's an improvement strategy, so um, as, it's, as long as that student is improving, so they might not jump a whole level of achievement, they might simply jump from, say, an A1 to an A2, it might be just um, a ladder placement, but as long as they're improving. So it's always plus one. And we have plus one for students, but we also have plus one for teachers. So teachers continue to improve their capability and their practice. Okay. Yeah. Um, Ms. Romeo, Departmental Oversight, what the self reflection? Only, the only mandatory um, reflection would be the school improvement unit that Grant spoke about that is cyclical every four years. Um, and the school is assessed against the nine domains within the school improvement hierarchy. Um, in terms of um, prioritising future work, the school improvement unit come up with a series of key priorities um, which are identified for the school. Now, I've just been through this process, um, not last week, the week prior, and I'm anticipating getting my report back so that we can start planning for the next four years, and that will cover suggestions and recommendations for further steps to take with inclusion or areas that I might like to consider for the future. Okay. The witnesses this morning have done a little bit of your work for you in it's terms uh, of describing the, um, the, the journey towards inclusion within your schools. But I did want, but I did want to give each of you the opportunity to see if there's anything you wanted to add to that journey or if there's anything you disagree with about how it was explained. 
Ms. Pritchard, would you like to start? Uh, there's nothing that I want to, want to disagree with. I think um, Catherine gave a very clear picture of our journey of inclusion. The only thing she forgot to share was the principal taught as a co-teacher. So yes. I went into the classroom mm. and I taught alongside Catherine, I also taught alongside a first year teacher as well, and we co-taught a year eight history class. So I did that very purpose purposefully um, because we can't step around it that principals are the key drivers um, for inclusion um, in schools and across schools and I think we need to uh, walk the talk. So if we're going to talk about co-teaching then we should be able to do it ourselves and demonstrate that practice for our teachers. All right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mr Dow? I probably, um, as I said, we've started a little bit earlier uh, than the actual policy came out. But in saying that, that, there was always a policy about every student succeeding. And uh, the, the timing was right. It, it wasn't just, hey, let's do in inclusion. It was an environment then when uh, schools were, were really uh, having a good hard look at themselves with uh, support from the department about their school improvement journey. Um, so uh, quite a few things came together about uh, setting high expectations for all students uh, uh, in this region, and I'm not sure how wide it was across the state, but uh, around the 2014-2015 time, we were doing work with Lynn Sharrett, and she had uh, a series of beliefs, and, and one of them was that uh, all students can achieve high standards given the right amount of time and support, and that became basically the moral imperative uh, and our core business. Um, as well as that along the side, there's always a number of, of drivers happening at the same time. Uh, as well as that, we, was at, we were examining our teaching and learning and, and, uh, in, in the classroom and making sure that we had the best quality teachers uh, in the classroom that, so that we could get maximised learning as well. So there was a number of agendas rolling at the same time and this one really fitted in really well. Thank you. Ms. Rolio? Very similar story. Um, we had a focus on quality teaching and learning and the students with disability were within our school community. Uh, however, they weren't an inclusive model. So we recognised that there was a collection of young people here and with the Every Student Succeeding um, State Schools Policy Statement that was first released in 2014, um, those students weren't, their needs weren't being addressed according to the policy. And so it was a conversation starter. At the beginning, um, there was, very, there was very little resistance to actually moving towards an inclusive model, but there was a lot of fear, particularly from the teaching teams and people like that. So we required, the journey needed to be um, not quick, it needed to be considered and, and determined so that we could travel the course. Okay. I think each of your statements speak about you having high expectations for all of your students and you would have heard some evidence earlier in the week about the negative impacts of devalu devaluation of people with disability and the negative impacts of having low expectations of people with disabilities. Do you each have an observation in respect of the importance of having high expectation of all your students? I, I think it makes the world of difference in, uh, in your school culture and, and that's what we're talking about. We're talking about uh, developing and changing school culture, that it's about high expectations for, not only for students, but for um, teachers as well. And um, in our school, that, that's been our biggest change, is that uh, I believe we've, we've given students um, reasonable aspirations and high aspirations to reach, and, and I've asked teachers to, to work hard to meet those high expectations as well. And I agree with what you said before, there was possibly students walking through gates uh, with low expectations before and, and meeting those low expectations. Um, and we, we've definitely raised the bar. Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, absolutely, Grant's correct. Um, high expectations for our students, um, but high expectations for our teachers and also revisiting those expectations and revisiting those practices and challenging our own practices um, and challenging our own beliefs. I think that's really important to maintain those high expectations for both our students and also for our teaching and support staff as well. Can, can I just add to that too? Um, it also has a flow-on effect with parents and caregivers 
because mm. in meetings and consultations, the teachers and, and the teams at school can reinforce the possibility of high expectations and achieving high expectations. And it also opens a world for parents about what might be possible for their young people with disability. Now, I don't think anybody's claiming that Queensland education have got it, has got it perfect yet. So, and that's been acknowledged, of course, that we are in the infancy in respect to the new policy. What I want to turn to now is um, what you see as the barriers and or challenges in going on this journey towards um, inclusion and in, within inclusion. Can I start with you, Ms. Finolio? Mm -hmm. You speak about um, a barrier being the architectural structure of your buildings and classrooms. Can you explain that, please? All right. Um, the school was first established in 1950, and we have a piece of architecture in the school that represents every decade. Um, the newer buildings, the ones from the last um, 10 to 15 years, meet modern legislation regarding access for people with disability. Prior to that, um, you can look around the school and we have a whole conglomeration of things. The, the, the standard building in the 60s was the two-storey um, with the winding staircases and, you know, students accessed them as, as best they could. My school, the majority of the classrooms in the school are built like that. Um, it's very confronting and challenging timetabling and getting students to access specialist classrooms, particularly with their peers, because you can say that that classroom has great disability access, but in a secondary school, students um, traditionally travel from classroom to classroom depending on curriculum area or sp specific design needs. So I have a moral um, dilemma um, but it's easily one within myself because I refuse to have a student placed in a classroom and stays in that classroom all day because that's not the general norm of what happens in a secondary school. So we have to investigate ways where we can utilise buildings to get the widest experience we can um, geographically on the site for those people knowing we cannot access the upper buildings. Um, we did get some functionality to one building um, but the, the lift is unreliable and I won't take the risk of putting a student upstairs if I can't get them down. So we have all sorts of complications, which is nobody's fault. Um, the expense of transforming the structures to meet modern requirements would be unfathomable. They're all full of asbestos. They're double story. They're all sorts of complications. So we just have to um, do the best we can. Um, and. Architecturally, I have to just sort of manage the structures as best I can. Ms Pritchard, do you have any observations on this topic? Oh, we've got similar um, challenges because our schools were built in the same era. Um, we have just had um, a lift installed. It's not operational yet. However, it does only provide us access to the top story of one of our buildings. Mm -hmm. And the cost that is attached to that um, is considerable. Um, as we would like all of our students and students with disability to be able to access the top story of all of our buildings. Um, because a number of our buildings, they're specialised classrooms mm. like hospitality centres and, and so forth that they need to access as part of the curriculum. Thank you. Mm. Mr Dow, do you have similar challenges? Oh, th not really. We're a 30-year-old uh, school. Um, we're, we're flat and, and low set which makes um, access a little bit easier in, in saying that there's uh, always continual improvement happening um, with, with, with ramps to, and, and doorways to improve access for students in uh, wheelchairs. Thank you. Is there a process whereby you can request funds for the transformation of your buildings yes, to that's make correct. them really accessible? Yeah. Um, it's called Ed for All and that's why we've gained the funding to do the improvements that we've done and, and provide that access. That's undercover walkways and ramps and so forth. Um, that's and, where and the, that's, that's the non-performing lift came from. Mm -hmm. um, it's only new. Um, it's only new. Oh, yeah, right. it's only oh, new no. and, and really um, it's probably happened at our school somewhat faster than other schools. So I'm actually pleased with what we have functioning um, currently in 2019. Ms. Miller, I wanted to take you to paragraph 28 of your statement. This is page 7, it's the last page. 
Now, I'm going to read it to you and then I'm going to ask you to explain it to mm -hmm. me, please. My challenge as principal is to ensure fidelity of our practices, provision of ongoing, ongoing professional development, induction of new staff, and active engagement with the wider school community. If I do not address this challenge and monitor school practices on an ongoing and regular basis, then barriers may emerge in the continuing implementation of inclusive education at Ingham State High School. My role as principal is to ensure line of sight, um, to ensure that the inclusive practices journey is continuing and travelling um, the way my expectation is that it would be. We have um, new staff coming into the school at all times. At the end of any year, schools have teachers transfer out, teachers retire. Um, we have teachers who go on maternity leave and you need to replace those people with new staff who may or may not come with any knowledge of inclusive schooling practices. So we need to have something in place where we can actively engage those people, growing their professional knowledge in that space. Um, likewise, with staff who are at the school on a long-term basis, we need to ensure that we're ongoing with our professional learning because the research is um, always exploring and having new evidence-based strategies that we can employ, that we can use in classrooms. Likewise, teachers who have been in the school for a long time, many of them want to try new things and perhaps try new co-teaching partnerships. So all of that involves a new professional learning experience for them. And we need to be able to provide the means for that to happen. If, uh, and, and likewise with the school community engagement, I have an obligation to keep the school informed about how we run, what we do. Um, we're a public organisation, and so the community has a right to know what's going on in the school. So that's part of my responsibility in terms of PR and just information sharing. If I don't continue um, to pay due attention to all of those areas, then barriers could emerge that I didn't see coming. So I have to be on the front to make sure I know what I might not know. Thank you. Ms Pritchard or Ms Adele, do you have an observation, any comments in respect of what Ms Rolio just said? No, I don't think. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms Pritchard, can I take you please to paragraph 28 of your statement? That's at page eight. Mm -hmm. And you're, you were asked in our notice to you to um, identify things that could be done to improve the education of students with a disability. And, and one thing you identified was to change the archaic and redundant staffing model to include an increased number of teachers allocated to schools with disability enrolled and learning in mainstream classrooms. Can you tell us about that, please? Well, the staffing model, as I've described there, is archaic. And it is redundant. The complexity um, of, of the complexity of students that are enrolling in our schools, the complexity of their learning needs, the complexity of their behavioural needs, their social emotional learning needs, and the expectation, and it's non-negotiable, the expectation that we put on our teachers to provide those personalised learning experiences um, for our teachers. The staffing model is 41 years old. It needs to be revisited and it needs to be done so. Um, it needs to be prioritised to provide us with more teachers so then we can implement uh, more co-teaching for our students, to support our students, more co-teaching across our schools, across curriculum areas, across year levels and also across schools, um, to provide that personalised teaching and learning for, for students with disability and for students with additional learning needs. Right. So at the moment, you know, we have um, class numbers, so 7 to 9, 1 to 28, and then 10, 11, 12, you know, 1 to 25, one teacher to 25. Thank you. I, I suspect the next point you've, you've raised in your statement is linked in, in part, that is increased planning and preparation time allocations above the 210 minutes for teachers teaching students with disability. Mm. Is that 
linked to the funding yeah, so, model? And, and that's that's linked to to the current staffing model that we've got. So teachers, um, when they're employed, they're employed as a as a full um, full time employment as a one. Um, then the expectation uh, that the school, well, the staffing um, model that we have that our teachers teach 17 out of 20 lessons and then three out of those 20 le lessons is the preparation and correction time. Um, our teachers, and I say this without apology, uh, need more than 210 minutes or three 70 minute sessions for preparation and correction if they're to do justice and provide those personalised learning experiences for our students with disability and additional learning needs. Um, it is only practical and it's common sense. Thank you. You also um, list increased financial resources to schools to support the professional learning for teachers who teach students with disability. Expand on that for me, please. Um, so ju that's just linked to our whole school professional learning plan and we prioritise um, professional learning for our teachers that are teaching students with disability to improve their teaching capability. Um, a lot of that time um, that we do that professional learning is um, on weekends or after school during twilight sessions. Um, if it is during class time, then we need to replace that teacher. Um, in particular, if that teacher is coming out of a co-teaching arrangement, that teacher still needs to be replaced so that we maintain those two teachers in that one classroom. Do all teachers at uh, your school have specific training in teaching children with disability or dealing with the behavioural issues, for example, that might arise from time to time? No, they don't. No. no. How does that work? That'll come to my next point. Where come recommendation to come to your next point. Yeah. Okay. That'll come to like mandatory training, which is a, another question that I want to come out of commission. Okay, we'll, we'll come to that. Yeah. You've also um, listed as a as a matter of reducing the allocation of teacher aids to school, but increasing teacher allocation as an alternative staffing model. Can you explain that, please? Um, and look, this is, this is a personal view because I believe our, our students with, a, with disability are entitled to a teacher, not a teacher aid. Um, and I pose the question, why, why shouldn't they be entitled to a teacher aid? Why, why shouldn't our children with a disability be entitled to, uh, sorry, to a teacher um, other, rather than a teacher aid? Um, our teachers, teachers are trained, they're, they're skilled in their practice, um, they can deliver the curriculum, they can provide instruction in the curriculum, they can assess the curriculum, they report on the curriculum. Our students with disability are entitled to a quality teacher, um, just like our students without disability. So if you can just explain that a little bit more, um, because uh, obviously... Yeah, I, I don't want any Sorry. more money yep. for teacher aids. If you could convert my teacher aid um, allocation into more teachers, um, I'd be very pleased about that. But I want to I want to go into a little bit more, which is your school has a strong co-teaching model. Yes, it has. Yeah. Now, ideally for you, that means two teachers in a room, mm -hmm. rather than a teacher and a teacher aide. That's correct. Okay. Now, explain the concept of parity of teaching in a co-teaching model when you've got two teachers in a room as opposed to a teacher and a teacher aide, please. That's correct. So. Um, co-teaching two teachers in the same class, they have equal responsibilities for the teaching, um, the assessing, the reflecting, the reporting um, of the students that are in that class. The teacher aid, by definition of their role and by their EB um, agreement, does not allow them to teach the curriculum. Only a teacher can do that. If, if a teacher aid is teaching the curriculum, well, that is a breach of their EB. They are unable to do that. Um, and two teachers in the same classroom uh, supports not only our students with disability, but all of our students. And they're, they're teaching in a number of different ways throughout, depending on what the needs of the students are. Um, and that is reflective of each lesson. So each lesson in a co-teaching arrangement can look very, very different. Um, the teacher aid is constrained by the definition of their role. 
assuming you get your wish. Thank you. And you have, <laughs> you have two co-teachers teaching the class, but within the class there are one or two children with disability with substantial needs. It might be toileting, it might be personal care, it might be taking medications or whatever. Is this a function then is taken over by one of the two co-teachers or do you need another teacher's aid in addition to the two teachers? I don't want any teacher aids. That's another point I want to bring up. So teacher aids currently performing medical procedures like catheterisation, peg feeding, tubing and so forth. Um, in my view, that should not be part of their role. That should be performed by a medical practitioner um, attached to the school. That should not be performed by a teacher aid. So you want not only co-teaching, you want a medical practitioner there at all times? Exactly Just right. like old people taking a cruise who yes, need a they're medical entitled practitioner to that. at all times? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yep. Anything else that comes with the two-teacher model? Got a couple of things. Close your mouth. Could I add that co-teaching is one of the strongest research evidence-based strategies that exists? Can I ask then, um, it, can you have more students if you have co-teachers? I mean, you know, because immediately there's going to be the question of the economics of it. Um, so can you slightly increase no. the student numbers in the class? No, that's the, not the model that I would work from. No, absolutely okay. not. We want to reduce the one-to-one uh, -one ratio. So the less students in the class, the more attention the teachers can give to, to, to the students. Sure. But reducing class size so that it's about 10 to 15 doesn't have the same impact as putting two teachers in with 25 students. Mm -hmm. The model changes slightly when the diversity and the, the size of the group of the class needs to be a critical mass as well, not yeah. a tiny, tiny group. And mass. in addition to that, the teacher may have one to eight or one to 15, but it's what the teacher actually does in that classroom. It's the impact that that teacher has so it's the teaching, the quality teaching that the teacher does in that classroom that makes the difference, that has the impact on the student. Is there a model anywhere in Queensland or for that matter Australia where there are somebody from the medical field, or maybe a nurse, not necessarily I suppose a medical practitioner as such? So, so we have school nurses but they don't perform medical procedures. So there are school nurses in schools, and there's one in my school, allocated to my school, um, but that uh, their role does not include medical procedures. Is that because they're not qualified to do that, or is that some departmental No, not at directors? all. That's just in their role description. They're that's, not employed by us. They're employed by Queensland Health. Yes. Yeah. So a revisit of that role would be um, something we could look forward to. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> can, I, can I pick up that topic? for a moment, um, and can you explain to me your perception, your view, on the difficulty with student perception on two fronts. The first with a teacher aide attending to their medical needs and then being in the classroom, if that happens. And, and secondly, the perception a student might have that the teacher aide is in fact their teacher. Mm. Could you explain to me the complexity that you've observed in that respect? Yeah, okay. So sometimes those, those lines are blurred. So we have a teacher aide that would be performing those medical procedures like toileting and catheterisation. And then from there, they then go over and, you know, go back into the classroom or go into the classroom and then um, they're working with that student um, on the curriculum or whatever learning activity or assessment that those students are working for. So for me, that, that line is blurred. Um, someone that's, that's supporting you with curriculum requirements um, preferably should not be the person that is toileting you. Um, just to keep that professional, um, professional boundaries in place, professional lines in place. Um, I've had requests from teacher aides in regards to accessing YouTube because it supports whatever the teacher's teaching, um, teaching from the curriculum and that request um, has been denied because any request I get needs to come from the teacher. 
um, not the teacher aid, because the teacher is responsible for the teaching and learning for that student with a disability or without a disability. Uh, sometimes we have a blurred line between the communication between a teacher aid and a parent, where the parent should be working with the teacher of that student, not the teacher aid in regards to their teaching and learning and their assessment. You've provided in your statement a list of a number of, a number of issues. We have touched on, on some of them now. Um, what I, the one I wanted to pick up on before I come to Mr Dale is this paragraph 47. Uh, students with disabilities who transfer into the school during the school year and who don't commence the start of the year with the school. Mm and that the school's required to submit an application for additional funding, uh, which is not always successful, and the school is notifying, notified that the pool of funding is empty, then the school is required to provide support and find the human and financial resource from its currently exhausted and allocated funding. Now, I've heard a little bit about this from some other witnesses. Yeah, yeah. Can you expand on that for me, mm -hmm. please? Yeah, so, so and, and we have touched on these issues. Um, when, when previously we have spoken about um, EAP and the funding allocation that's attached to that. So when you get a student in through um, throughout the year, they, they don't come along with any funding. So any other, any support, um, any additional support that they require, uh, you have to find that um, from school-based funds. So there is no funding al allocation that um, comes along with that student if they enrol um, during you know, during semester two or during semester one. So you have to you have to go through the process of of um, of um, putting in a submission for additional funds, and sometimes that's not successful particularly if it's in the later part or later part of the year in semester two. Okay. Because that's happening across the state, so all schools are in the same position, so, um, you know, everyone's, everyone's applying for those additional funds. Have you had the same experience, Ms Finolio? Yes, and yes. Mr Dale? Um, pro probably not as much. I would say that there's still sometimes... The, 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 the concern is still the same, however, sometimes with mobility, you, you, you may lose one and pick up a student, and so basically your overall package is, is very similar to what it was before. Okay. Um, Mr Dale, I'm going to come now to the barriers and challenges you've identified in your statement, and then I'm going to allow each of you to um, give us your wish list, as it were, of things that you'd like to see the Commission accomplish. Um, Mr Dale, paragraphs 40 to 41, you list the first barrier or challenge as human resources. Can you explain that for us, please? I, I, as I've mentioned before, I've, um, I, I value, and I think, I don't want to speak for Pam, but um, when Pam was talking to, about teachers, that, that's really recognising the four years of university and the training that the teachers have done as well, um, as, as compared to the, the, the shorter courses that teacher aides do, and I think that's part of that that conversation that teachers are teachers, that they've done the training, they've done those four years. Um, there, there's probably two issues here with, with human resources at the moment for, for uh, our school and, and, and maybe uh, a little bit wider as well. There's a teacher shortage at the moment uh, in, in Townsville, I believe it's across Queensland and, and across Australia at the moment and I, uh, that, that's a concern. Um, at the moment in, in our school, we've just managed to fill our staffing quota for, for this year. We've uh, gone for large periods of time without the, the, the staff that we've required. Uh, in, in fact, in our school, we've got two uh, student teachers that are on permission to teach, uh, filling that role because they couldn't find someone across Australia to fill those roles. And I believe that story uh, maybe widespread uh, across Townsville, right across Queensland and, and right across Australia as well. So there's that, that bigger picture of uh, attracting people into the profession and I think that's a really important uh, point to make. I know uh, the Queensland Education Department is, is working hard with, a, with an attraction unit. Uh, in fact, our school is piloting something called a Future Teachers Project at the moment where we've got Year 11 and Year 12 students actually starting a teaching degree in school. Um, it's being paid for by 
the department in, in conjunction with the local university. Uh, ours is James Cook University. So we've got uh, seven students at the moment for this year and, and more next year that are well on, underway on their, their first unit of work in their teaching degree, which I, I think is just fabulous. And uh, something that we probably should have thought of uh, earlier, we should have been promoting our own craft to, to our students. We get the best look at them. We know, uh, we, we, we know their background, we know their academic marks, and we know personalities that we think would make cracker teachers. So I'm really pleased with that. Um, Do you agree with Ms Pritchard's view about teacher's aid? My preference would always be for a teacher. However, I believe teacher aides have a really important role to play, both within schools and within some classrooms. Uh, any of your year 11 and 12, um, the seven people with disability, students with a disability? I couldn't. Uh, there, there's students there with... with uh, there's anxiety students, there's... Um, I'm just... I don't think there's any students with a disability, as in verified students with a disability, but there may be some that are on the NCC data. Thank you. The, the next uh, challenge you list are the requirements of the Educational Adjustment Program, and, and they reflect the evidence that Ms Swancutt gave this morning with respect to the challenges presented by that process. Was there anything in addition to what Ms Swancutt mentioned that you wanted to say about that topic? No, no, no not, not at all. That's a process that, uh, that, that is... Um, that is looked at by the, the head of inclusive schooling, and that's basically from feedback from from Lauren and, and the team involved in doing that. So that's very similar. All right, uh, Ms. Pritchard or uh, Ms. Manolio, did you have any observations with respect to the challenges, or whether the, the EAP requirements present challenges with respect to providing what you need for students with disabilities? In our location, it provides challenges with access to um, specialised. I mean, we don't have paediatricians located within the town. So the mobility issues um, and, and getting people to access diagnosis and verification is very difficult. Thank you. Ms Pritchard, anything further? Um, I, I just think, I, and I think I think Lauren Swankup mm. brought it up around the scope of EAP and the... Yeah. Can I, sorry, just speak into the microphone. Oh, sorry, this, yeah, around um, broadening the scope of EAP categories um, for our students with disability, I think that's important in the use of NCCD data as well as a resource allocation. Okay. Yeah. And is the essence of that, with respect to broadening the scope of EAP, is that you've got students with needs that simply don't fit into the categories, so... Yeah, it does not fit in those six categories, yeah. Okay. Um, Mr Dale, the next challenge you mentioned is the reporting requirements of the NCCD. Can you speak to that, please? Oh, very bl briefly, because I, as Lauren said, before uh, there's a requirement that uh, teachers make adjustments for the students and it's also a requirement that there's some reporting of those adjustments as well. Uh, high school teachers can teach up to 150 students. Um, those students are doing a range of different su subjects and therefore require a range of different adjustments, uh, possibly for each subject as well. It's, it's a huge task and it leads on to what uh, Pam was saying about uh, staffing and the complexity of, of schooling um, compared to what it used to be. Um, with the staffing model, if I can just go down that line for a moment Please. as well, uh, th th there is a, a bit of a band-aid solution at the moment uh, in respect to that schools are given some discretionary funding through uh, a system called Investing for Success. It's uh, based on the, the Gonski scheme of money coming through to schools and schools use that to supplement uh, staffing within schools to, to do programs such as co-teaching and other initiatives that are happening throughout schools. H however, sometimes the, the complexity outweighs the funding, for sure. Thank you. And uh, your statement also reflects some of the other observations made already today about um, teacher workload, uh, funding and staffing being linked to EAP time demands on teachers to develop individual programs of learning and assessment and the available time for staff to work collaboratively to develop quality programs 
and it, pedagogical practices. It, it is a real change teaching environment to what it was when I was beginning teaching 30 years ago. Uh, it, I was, rightly or wrongly, a very much a solo teacher. I did my own planning, I taught my own class, and I had knowledge of my own students. And it's a very collaborative approach now, and it's fantastic quality of teaching and learning that's happening in schools right throughout Queensland at the moment. Mm -hmm. But there's a demand on, on the teachers with that, and there's a huge amount of workload associated with that as well. Now, I don't want to deprive you of any time with respect to the next topic, which is to tell me what you'd like to see come out of the Commission, but I do want to come to you, Mr Dale, about your own personal experience in co-teaching back when you were teaching, because you had a direct comparison experience between a co-teaching class on a subject and a class that wasn't co-taught. Are you able to, to tell the Commission the, the difference in results? I when I was teaching. Is that correct? Have I got this I, 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 30 years, I can't remember that I was a, a phys ed teacher. Um, okay. I, I shared. Yeah, I did teach. Did. All right, no worries. Sorry. Perhaps I've got the wrong example. Yep. But but in terms of the co-teaching, this is an important thing. It's coming up It's coming up constantly. Mm. Is anybody able to speak to the, the comparison between, re, between benefits to students and teachers of that co-teaching model compared to the, the non- Well, I can speak to it because I co-taught um, mm. most recently. Um, and, and, and the expectations um, are definitely, um, yeah, there, there's an increase in expectations um, of, of both planning and delivery of instruction um, when you're co-teaching. But you also have to work very collaboratively with the other teacher. And that relationship you establish with your co-teaching partner is really important. And finding that time, you really need to be um, flexible and negotiable around plan around finding that time and negotiating that time and using that time effectively to, to co-plan and co-reflect on the student's progress in, in your um, class and then decide on, okay, the next level of instruction, what's that going to look like, uh, am I going to be doing, uh, you know, what differentiation is required, what focused teaching or, intensi or intensive teaching um, is required in my next lesson and the lesson after that and the following lesson. Are the co-teachers equal? Partners or equal instructors? Yeah, we sure are. Uh, so no, no one is. Um, e even when I taught in that co-teaching partnership, I did not go in there as the principal. I went in there as a teaching colleague, and um, and my practice um, reflected that relationship with that co-teacher. Um, I did. I was very conscious of um, not dominating um, the amount of time that I provided instruction, or the direction of the lesson, or the management of student behaviour in the classroom. That was definitely shared equally uh, um, with my co-teacher. Um, so th that's very different. And I know when when I taught. Um, outside of a co-teaching relationship, I can echo um, Grant, you, d you definitely taught in, in a silo, you delivered your, your curriculum and generally it was um, delivered mid-field. There wasn't a lot of differentiation and there wasn't a lot of recording of that differentiation or a reflection of the student's progress per lesson um, and then a change of instruction. Um, um, for the next lesson and so forth. You did you, you did it by yourself. You didn't share your practice with other teachers. Teachers didn't come in and watch your practice. Um, but co-teaching, you definitely learnt from each other. And um, I both co-taught with, with Catherine, which was wonderful. I, I learnt many, many strategies around managing behaviours of students with disability and those without disability as well. Um, also our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students as well and, and, and classroom management strategies, learning strategies, learning styles. Um, I also learned a lot of our first year teacher as well. So she came with expertise um, that I learned, um, that I could learn from as well. So um, that's why I think I'm, I'm such an advocate because I definitely walk the talk and the success rates, the um, pass rates, the attendance rates and the behaviour um, of, of our classroom, of our year eight history class was, was exceptional and continued to improve. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. I apologise. It was Mr. Bates who was telling me about his positive co-teaching oh, okay. experience. Oh, no. Yeah, it's no problems at all. Barristers should never rely on their memories. They should just rely on their notes. Uh, Ms. Nolio, can you tell us what you'd like to see come out of the Commission? Um, moving forward, my expectation is the ongoing implementation of the 17 key recommendations from the Deloitte's review. And Thank ongoing... you. are going to slow down just a touch. Okay. 
all those recommendations have been accepted in principle, have they not, by mm. the Queensland Government? They should. But it will be a journey and a long journey to see the implementation. I wouldn't like to see our energy fade halfway along. An ongoing consideration and implementation of the Queensland Department of Education policy statement and the journey associated with the nine principles outlined in that statement. A decreased reliance on paraprofessionals, for example, teacher aides, to monitor and deliver learning to the most vulnerable of our young people, which includes students with disability. Differentiated teaching and learning, enabling all students to access and engage with the Australian curriculum and participate in age appropriate learning with peers. The Every Student Succeeding State School Strategy is relevant for all students. The Every Student with Disability Succeeding Strategy reinforces the inclusive position. I will celebrate when the latter policy statement is totally subsumed within the first. In terms of improvements which would specifically assist Ingham High over, overcome barriers for the future, it's all around resourcing and it's resourcing for planning, collaboration, co-teaching and professional learning. There are key words and messages that keep appearing across, across these last um, few days. As principal, I have the autonomy and the moral imperative to address every student succeeding with every opportunity that I'm given. Within the constraints of my resourcing constructs, I have the ability to manipulate and manoeuvre, be flexible and use my resourcing to target the areas best needed on a day-to-day -day basis. Recently, I was asked to put a nominal dollar value on educating a student with a disability. As I explained, this is not only impossible, it is an immoral challenge. Resources need to be allocated and flexible enough to be reallocated wherever the need is greatest on any given day, week, month or yearly basis. It needs to ensure that we best meet the needs of every student in every classroom every day. Principals require the autonomy to make such decisions to best suit the context of the student population currently enrolled at their school. Co-teaching is an evidence-based strategy widely recognised in the research to improve learning outcomes for all students, particularly students with disability, when implemented in general classrooms. Consideration of the staffing allocative model is required to resource co-teaching and the associated co-planning, co-delivery and co-reporting. Coordinated opportunities within the timetable day for school-based professional learning, including access to online engagement, with the likes of TED Talks or engagement with blogs, with experts from the field like Paula Cluth or Julie Kelston. Engaging with the research is essential to strengthening practice. We would never consider accessing the services of medical practitioners who did not keep abreast of current research, trends and updated use of technologies, so why should we be any different in education? Special schools are not within my sphere for reference. Currently I am principal of a school in a rural location where a special school is not an option and so every student within our community is entitled to enrol and attend our school and has an expectation that a quality education will be provided. This is a challenge, but a challenge that we don't walk away from. No teacher at Ingham High aspires to be a special education teacher working within a model that segregates students for the purpose of learning. Special education training may be an advantage, but it's not a requirement for good pedagogy and quality teaching and learning. An expert teaching team, given the right resourcing, and targeted and ongoing professional learning will build the capability to differentiate the delivery of the Australian <coughs> curriculum. A whole school approach supports all students accessing support when and as required. No teacher walks into a classroom expecting to find 25 young people with identical learning needs and learning expectations. Teacher expertise is being able to deliver a differentiated approach to meet the needs of these learners. As Grant mentioned earlier, Faces on the Data is a reference to the work of Lynn Sharrett and an approach we use at Ingham State High School to highlight each learner is an individual. Every young person has a face and every young person deserves that their face is recognised. In terms of facilities, I've already mentioned the Ingham High architecture is not designed to support physical access for students or in fact clients, including parents and caregivers with physical disability. Could this is a major slow, issue. Sorry, just slow down a smidge. Sorry. It gets excited. I do get excited. 
This is a major issue compounded by asbestos and multi-storey buildings and a random eclectic collection of pathways and roof lines which may or may not provide wet weather access around certain parts of the school. A real complication for students using electric wheelchairs and I have one at the moment, I had two recently and I have more coming next year. Ingham is noted for the prevalence of wet weather, cyclones and flooding and for that purpose we host a cyclone shelter on our school grounds. Coming out of the Royal Commission, my main interest is in all around leadership. Within a secondary school setting, a principal is assisted by deputy principals and heads of department. Heads of special education sit parallel to this organisational structure. At Ingham High, we have informally renamed our hoses HOD Inclusive Practices, which nominally addresses the complication. An inclusive schooling model requires a head of department closely aligned with the school leadership team. This requires HR and industrial review to rewrite the hoses role description and associated award and employment conditions to align with that of head of department colleagues. It is different and it shouldn't be. Segregated staffing models for teachers and teacher aides also need to be removed as currently we have students allocated to SEP models which no longer exist. Quality leadership enables transformational change. I seek a reunited commitment to enhance leadership capability for school leaders to create high performing inclusive schools. I advocate to establish a system where opportunities to provide principals with coaching to reflect on their in instructional leadership actions and synergise these with inclusive practices is established and maintained. Consideration of a model of instructional coaching to support principals and meet them at their level of capability development offers targeted and ongoing support until all barriers are challenged. Research suggests that schools are more successful when leaders actively guide their school towards more inclusive schooling practices and meet their specific responsibilities as equity leaders to establish a strong foundation in student-centred planning, quality curriculum and pedagogical practices. This is my blue sky dreaming. Thank you. Chair, I will, I will need to ask to be able to sit another 10 minutes past 4.30 today so that Ms Pritchard and, and Mr, Mr Dale is able to, are able to tell us what they wish. I can indicate um, <laughs> that Ms McMillan doesn't have any cross-examination. Thank you. Ten minutes. Yes. Thank Ten you. minutes. Well. You're fine. Okay. Yeah. I, I have six and you've heard yeah. some of them. So the introduction of a more simplistic and flexible resource model moving to an as-needs basis throughout the year as a method of resource allocation to schools to support students with disability and also our students with additional learning needs. Increasing the recognised and scope of the EAP categories and NCCD as a method of resource allocation for schools. And this is the mandatory training one that I spoke earlier about. I think there should be an introduction of an annual mandatory training for teaching and also for support staff in the disability standards for education. Uh, review of our staffing allocation to schools, resulting in an increased teacher allocation mm. that is directly aligned to the complexity of student learning and behavioural needs. And that needs to be done on student enrolment. To further support the growth of teaching, which I'd like to see in and across schools, an additional time for our teachers to prepare for the instructional and the access adjustments and modification for students with disability and to provide the personalised learning required to fulfil those diverse capabilities of each student. I'd like to see a review of a school-based medical practitioners, including our school nurses allocated to schools and the application process for our allied health services to better support the daily medical and the toileting and feeding needs of our students with disability. Um, with, I would also like to um, schools to have a look at including targeted training 
for, for specific disabilities and including the universal design for learning, the UDL framework and training in trauma-informed practices to support our teachers with developing improved capability to differentiate the teaching and learning and also the effective behaviour management and support for all of our students. And finally, uh, is, to, uh, is to revisit and continue to remain committed to the full implementation of the 17 recommendations from the Disability Review. There needs to be accountability measures and quality assurance processes. They need to be explicit to ensure implementation of the recommendations remain authentic and also remain sustainable. Thank you, Ms Pritchard. Mr Dow. I won't uh, go over the, the many points that have been covered and I fully support all, all of those points. Uh, just from a holistic point of view to start off with, I, I would really like to see that the terms of reference of the uh, Royal Commission be met. I think that is a, a, that, that's the first outcome that we need to get from the Royal Commission. Uh, with, with that um, being met, I, I'm sure that we will have covered many of the other specific challenges that have been mentioned already. Um, uh, in respect to education though, uh, once again thinking um, a, a little bit more holistically, I, I would like to see that uh, that there's an Im improved community perception uh, of the role and purpose and importance of schooling in Australia. I struggle with the amount of negative media that uh, schooling gets in Australia. I think we keep degrading and, and downgrading the, the, the system. Um, I, we need to talk positively. There's some wonderful stories happening right across Australia. Uh, we have fantastic kids, there's plenty of success stories, and we need to be highlighting those and making sure everyone can meet that high standard as well. That's a, a possible outcome out of the Royal Commission as well. And just supporting what's been said before, there's a, some systemic and administration changes that can occur. Uh, there's uh, one of the ones that hasn't been mentioned today is about uh, the ability to and ease of accessing data for diverse groups of students within your school without doing so much interrogation to, to get that data. That would be a system I'd like to see. Um, and of course on the, the human resourcing side of the, or the resourcing side of things to allow for that collaborative work that's happening at the moment. Probably my, my last observation and uh, my, my last comment and something that I've sort of proud of is that I don't know what's, who the students are with disabilities at my school. I, I used to know at previous schools and uh, when I first started at Tharangau because they were the students that sat on the table outside the special education unit every lunchtime. I would see them. Now I probably couldn't identify students that are, that are verified with a disability or who exactly is on the, the data list. Um, and, and I think that's an achievement in itself. So. Uh, We've all started our improvement journey and, and uh, the, the Queensland Education Department is very much part of that, that every student succeeding and we tend not to talk in labels anymore, we talk about every student. Thank you. Thank you. So your last observation, just so we make sure it's not taken out of context, is when you say you can't identify students within your school as having disability, what you're communicating to the Commission is you now have such a process of inclusion within your school that all students are part of the general cohort and students are students. That's exactly right. Thank you. Uh, that's the evidence. Thank you very much, each of you, for uh, coming to the Commission and giving evidence and expressing your views so clearly and occasionally forcefully. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. May we, uh, as the Commission, extend our gratitude to the, all of the witnesses who've given evidence today. They, they met and gave their time to us last mm. week as well. We are very yes, Thank you very much for all that preparation. We do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I also mention, if I could, that the principals also came back early from their vacations mm. in order to access information on such short notice for the inquiry to fulfil notices. So perhaps that might be mentioned at this yes, we had our further appreciation for that. <laughs> that seems the ultimate sacrifice, I must say. Thank you. Uh, 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, um, you will have Miss Eastman of Senior Council.
uh, I'll be here too, <laughs> and we will hear from Ms Dunstan. Is Ms Dunstan the only witness for tomorrow? She is. And uh, I think we are planning to finish no later than 3.30 in the That's afternoon right. tomorrow. Yes. Very good. Thank you. All right, thank you. Then we'll adjourn until 10 o'clock tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.